Hey everybody, I'm Nick Von Walkerberth and you're listening to the Von Dubcast. These intros, I usually talk a little bit about the guests, what we talk about, and a bit about my life and what's been happening in it. If you want to skip right to the interview, skip to about 12 minutes. If not, buckle up and let's go. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 130 of the Von Dubcast. Um, just before I forget, because I've forgotten a couple of these intros, I'm just going to start off right with it. Um, please follow me on social media, um, Instagram, Facebook, that it really helps. Also, the guest, today's guest is uh, TJ Foster. This is his second time on the podcast. TJ grew up in Slave Lake. Um, his family was uh, into guiding uh, hunts, and we actually talk about that a bit on uh, on this podcast, taking guys out and kind of taking through the experience of hunting and passing that expertise onto them and trying to make them successful, which is something I find endlessly fascinating. I was really happy to be able to uh, chat with TJ on it here today. Um, so also go follow him uh, on social media as well. I should have it tagged in the description below. Other than that, um, I'm going to start off with another apology too, if you can hear the wind in this intro or in the episode itself. Um, I'm trying to move uh, my little podcast set up now that I'm in Edmonton uh, into this room at my parents' place, and it should be perfect for everything I want to do. Um, just kind of got the idea of how I'm going to set it all up, and I just have to move my my desk from my room with my computer and have been taking a few more steps towards streaming. Had somebody, uh, a buddy from school, come over and help me, uh, just kind of help me walk through the streaming, um, what would the word be? Not application, um, software maybe? Um and kind of, I don't know, for some reason, I feel like I get more scared to stream the closer I get to it and the more overwhelming I see how much there is to it. Because when you watch people stream, which I love to do, I love watching streamers, they just make it look so easy. Like there's nothing to it and you don't realize all the software and all the setup and all the different layers and shortcuts that they have set up. And I'm sure once I get into it, that stuff will come a little bit easier. But I think from the outset, it looks a little bit scary. But uh, working on it, and once I can move that all out to here, should be able to get a video component um, for the podcast again, even for the in, uh, in-person in ones, which I'm really happy about. And then we can start doing clips and a clip channel. I think that's really um, been holding the podcast back for, for growth factor uh, or for growth reasons, I mean. Um, because it is such a long podcast and I believe that, uh, it's worth it if you sit down and listen, but that's a big ask of somebody. And if they don't want to sit down and listen to a multi-hour interview, if we start putting up clips, five minutes, 10 minutes, two minutes, even, um, I think that's really gonna show people what we're all about and hopefully bring them in for the long haul. Cause that's where I think the true value is of these long form conversations is to really sit down and get someone's perspective and really be able to sink into their shoes at least for an hour or two or three. Um, so that's all great. Um, another really big, uh, um, accomplishment in my life. We did the first inaugural episode of our Oilers podcast, me and my best friend, Chase Rao. Um, and eventually that might probably get its own, um, podcast, uh, feed and it won't be just on the Von Dubcast one just for now for ease we're just putting it there while we uh build up a little bit of um I don't know I don't know what we're building we're building something and when it gets to a certain point it's gonna have its own thing but for now it's just gonna live here and uh that is something that I've been very excited to do I've always wanted to have more than one podcast and I never thought I would just stick to this one interview style I knew I wanted to have you know two three maybe even four podcasts that I can fill my week up with and just keep doing the skill that I love and keep getting better and better at it in different ways. Um, it's much different than this. It's a lot sillier. Um, it's super Homer. Like if you're expecting unbiased NHL content, you you should go look somewhere else. It is full on two degenerate Oiler fans concocting scenarios into why they're the best team in the league <laughs> for the most part. Um, we've got some really great feedback. People have really enjoyed it, but I mean, from a couple of my uh, friends who are Leaf fans and Calgary fans, they all are saying, like, come on, are you planning the parade? And you know what? Yeah, we are. We, we, we've got it all planned out. It's going to go by Chase's house. Then it's going to come by my place. Um, not that I have a place. It'll come back, but <laughs> come by my parents' place. Um, but we had a ton of fun. Um, and that's going to be a weekly thing where we're going to sit down, we're going to pick a day and be consistent with it and make sure that we're bringing you guys, um, the most biased Oilers, uh, Oilers content you can find, uh, weekly. And then there's also with that, um, getting that set up for a weekly podcast scenario where maybe even bring in a producer to come help us out with it. That opens the door to some of the other podcasts that I want to do on a weekly schedule and kind of, uh, can lay the groundwork for it. So I'm really, really excited about all that. It's nice to see a, a step forward taken, uh, just cause I've been so lazy with all the, all the rest of it. And with that Oilers Uncensored podcast, um, if you go share the post for it, we're giving away two tickets. We chase is giving away the 
beautiful bastard. <laughs> uh, two tickets to the Oilers Dallas game on uh, April 20th. So go share that post. I think in the post I said share it on Instagram, but if you share it on any social media, um, we'll enter you into a draw. We'll just put it into one of those random generators online, all the people's names. And uh, yeah, you win two tickets to that game. Should be a good one. And you know, what else did I want to talk about? I guess talk about this conversation. I mentioned a bit about it, but yeah, having TJ on, I always really enjoy talking to TJ. Um, I think people just get this idea of hockey players in their head and just who they are and what they think. And just growing up with TJ, I always knew that he's a very highly intelligent guy that doesn't, you know, he's very unique in how he thinks. And to bring that forward, I mean, I wasn't even prepared for some of the things we talked about. And especially after the podcast, just, uh, um, TJ brought this to me, but the, but he mirrored something that a sentiment that I feel all the time. Um, he was just saying like, man, this is very fun to uh, talk to somebody about some of these topics that are hard to talk about because it's a very specific knowledge base. And uh, we talked, you know, I think specifically with some of the conspiracy theory stuff where, you know, you get down a rabbit hole and you're like, ah, oh, because I do this all the time where I'm like, ah, oh, I could bring this thing up, but you're not even going to know what I'm talking about. And there might be two listeners that know what I'm talking about. So you just kind of stop. But then when you have someone in front of you, it doesn't really matter because, you know, you guys can follow along if you have no idea what we're talking about. We can kind of go back and forth. And we talked about, uh, you know, some pretty uh, some pretty interesting shit. And I usually try and stay away from uh, conspiracy theories uh, in general and just pick up my conspiracy theory knowledge only through podcasts that I trust that aren't in the conspiracy lane, but just when they dip in and kind of show the backing of how they've come to those decisions. And I kind of take that knowledge in and I compare that to everything else I hear and try not to actually strictly listen to any podcast or any uh, conspiracy podcast or any conspiracy YouTube channels. I really, really try and stay away from that. Um, and having said that, I think it was interesting to see someone like TJ that has probably, I would say probably more knowledge about some of the stuff than I do, um, depending what it is. And, uh, and to kind of see how well what I've picked up matches with uh, with with what he's been talking about. But yeah, we even chatted after the podcast about a lot of this stuff. And, uh, you know, I don't care, <laughs> you know, what people think about it. It's, it's, it's all interesting stuff to me. And if you don't like it, you know, that's uh, that that's fair enough. And uh, I always say this, but even TJ had mentioned, I don't know if he mentions it on the podcast or if it was after, but just like, we would t love to talk to people that would uh, want to bring the other side on any of the topics we brought up. I've been trying to uh, be more um, broad ranging with uh, some of my viewpoints. And just, I look on social media for friends that maybe um, diverge from my own uh, ideas on things, especially with the COVID stuff, which can't even say that word, but I I've just been trying desperately to have anybody come on and talk from the other side and just nobody will. And that's uh, interesting to me, but this isn't for everybody and I can think of a million different reasons why you wouldn't and why it's nerve wracking and all those things, but even people that have been on before and then, you know, just can't keep backing out. I don't know what it is, but like we said, if this isn't for you, that's just fine. No worries about that. There's going to be plenty of episodes. I talk about tons of stuff. There's, you know, um, ultra marathon runners and, uh, and, you know, healthcare workers. I had uh, someone on from the Dementia Institute. There's there's something for everybody in this podcast if you're willing and open minded enough to do a little bit of work to find what matches with you. And if this ain't it, that's too bad. But I think this is a great conversation. Oh, I kind of also went into this hungover as shit. <laughs> so I was very unprepared. I had zero questions written down and I was just kind of hoping and pray that, you know, me and TJ had enough to talk about, which we did. And I don't know why I was worried about it at all, but I actually went to my first EDM show. We went and saw stylist at station on Jasper, I believe, uh, on the Friday night, we went to the Oilers game and then we went to stylist and it was so much fun. I love that shit. I was born to rave. I think, you know, didn't uh, get into any of the too fun stuff. We were just kind of drinking, maybe smoke a joint before we went in there and maybe partway through the show, but nothing too crazy. And just we're there for the music. And, uh, you know, I had, had a couple, I had a couple, I had a ton of expectations going in because I've been hanging out with Chase so much and all of our friends that are really into the scene and, really wasn't what I expected in a lot of ways. And, you know, it wasn't, there was just lots of people enjoying music. There was nobody too fucked up. Okay. There was one girl that was too fucked up, had to get walked out, but like one person in a big show like that, like it was amazing. It was fun to watch people enjoy that type of music. It was fun to enjoy it myself. It was fun to dance all night. And yeah, it was awesome. But having said that, I definitely rolled uh, back from Chase's house, laid down to try and get, you know, a little bit of sleep was there for about 10 minutes and then teaches like, okay, I'll be, I'll, uh, I'll leave in half an hour. And I was like, oh shit, I got to get up. I got to, you know, do a little meditation, try and knock the fog out of my brain. So if I sound a little, uh, a little groggy, a little bit slurry on this podcast, you guys will know exactly why I, uh, probably should have just told you guys that in the outro and let you guess for yourself. But I don't know. I still enjoyed it. 
um, like I say, you, you never really remember. You're in such a flow state when you do these podcasts, at least myself. I never really remember what we talk about too specifically other than the broad strokes. And you just remember how the conversation made you feel. And uh, I really enjoyed this one. I would have TG on plenty more times to uh, really get down into the nitty gritty of some of this stuff. And I'm sure we will uh, off into the future. And like like I said, and I think I already wrote the description for it, but we definitely talk a little bit of hockey. I think the for, if you want to hear more of TJ's career and where he played and all that stuff, uh, hockey-wise, probably his first appearance on the podcast is where you want to hear that stuff if you haven't listened to it before. Um, but since we had already covered that, we kind of went a little bit of a different direction on this one, not to say we didn't talk some hockey, but it's uh, it's fun. And that's what I want to do with these things. And I'm hoping that in the future I can have uh, – you know, some really big guests on in whatever domain they are, and we can do an episode and talk about what makes them them and whatever special thing uh, made me aware of them. And then I can have them on again, and we can do kind of this, where you just explore more of the other facets of their life that uh, maybe isn't so front and center. And that's really enjoyable for me, and I appreciate it. And that's all shout out to TJ for being open about that stuff and and giving me his time and coming over here uh, to do it. And that was the other big difference was this one we got to do in person, whereas our last episode was on Zoom. And it's definitely a lot different experience doing in-person episodes versus on Zoom. So I had an absolute blast with it. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Other than that, I will stop rambling in this intro. I will get it, get it to you and I'll see you guys on the outro. Bye. All right. Thanks for being here, Teej. Yeah, no problem, buddy. So uh, you're back in school now? I just heard you bullshit with Ingo before we got in there. Yeah, I'm at uh, Nate for instrumentation. Um, instrumentation. This is my third semester, so I got one more, one and a half more. With, with COVID, yeah. everything's kind of slowed down, so mm-hmm. drawing it out a little more. But yeah, it's been good. Online yeah. thing is meh. Yeah. But yeah. what can you do? And that's a tough thing, like everyone I've been talking to about school and shit. Like, I'm trying to... Uh, you know, keep pause because if you don't have any other option, less for guys like yourself that are of a certain age, but these guys are 18, 19 going in, like for what you get out of university or, or, or school of any kind, it's the in-person shit that really, oh, yeah, it's, it's sure. you know, being the, seeing the friends, talking to people, the socialization is way more than the actual schooling. So it's like, man, if you have the situation where you can just to wait, or if you're just getting it to get the ticket, like you're doing, it doesn't yeah. really matter. But yeah, that in person's a, a a way better deal. Just yeah. like a podcast, right? We did that first one on Zoom, and this one's gonna be even better because we're Absolutely. actually sitting in front of each other. Well, yeah, like you went to U of A, mm-hmm. I was at U of A, and it's just such a different experience. You know, mm-hmm. like that's a bigger scale compared to right. say Nate, but it's just such a different experience. You see so much. You could just go stand in the quad and just people watch mm-hmm. all day. And yeah, you sure can learn more than you do in a classroom. Mm-hmm. Like. Mm-hmm. And like you realize uh, at university anyways, like my one accounting or finance class, I think there was 400 students Mm -hmm. and then in Nate it's online, but there's like 20 of us and it's a lot more personable. So it'd be nice to get in person and actually like, you know, we're buddies, but we're not buddies in the sense like we're, we're going out for beers Mm -hmm. because we haven't Mm -hmm. been able to. Exactly. You know, there's a couple that I'm closer with than others, but it's not like, you know, uni where, you know, if you wanted to go grab a beer somewhere Mm -hmm. like, you know, Hudson's campus or something, you could you know, or Earl's go grab a beer, mm-hmm. but it's been good. Um, mm-hmm. I'm a little older now, so it's, that's, that part's behind me. Now. Yeah. 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 You know, You've been there, done that. Going out party all the time <laughs> with the young bucks. So, uh. and I don't blame her, but yeah, it's, uh, it is what it is. I just mm-hmm. kind of want to get it done and get to work. Right. And maybe for, uh, I'm sure everyone listened from slave will know exactly what instrumentation is, but probably lots of my friends from university wouldn't have the first clue what that is. Uh, maybe just break down for people what instrumentation is. Yeah, you know, they. I hear that. I get that question a lot. Yeah, I bet it's, you do. It's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's like the development, commissioning, maintenance of like any process control. So anywhere where you have multiple things going on and you need to measure or, you know, gauge something, mm-hmm. that's kind of our job will be to make sure that everything is is where it should be. You know, if you're measuring flow, it's got to be, you know, r- correct or, mm-hmm. you know, k- mm-hmm. And if it's not, then you got to calibrate it and, yeah. you know, do maintenance. And and then there's also like the engineering side for our program where we can do like the, you know, the drawings and all the AutoCAD mm-hmm. stuff on mm-hmm. computers, the software right. stuff. So the engineering side, whereas that's, it's different than the, the apprenticeship program, mm-hmm. just in that sense, they gotcha. give you a little bit and they say, oh yeah, it's way better. But I know, you know, we'll see when, when we get into the field and all yeah. that, but 
Yeah, I think it's anything to do with like a process, whether it's, you know, working in pulp mills or mm-hmm. oil field. Or, yeah, you know, lots of oil field, one. yeah. And then like any manufacturing, you know, there's a lot. Right. It's, it's pretty big in like the food manufacturing to make right. sure like all your, you know, PLC stuff is running so that everything happens sequential and mm-hmm. how it should. Yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of like a, a dumbed down or, yeah. a, you know, easy explanation mm-hmm. of it. There's a lot more, but, yeah. you know, it's it's kind of tough to explain. It is, yeah. That, that That's kind of why I want to ask you because every time I've asked people what instrumentation is, they always... I've heard some bunch of bullshit answers that never sound good. That's that's the best one I think I've ever heard from somebody. I had to ask a couple of profs. I'm like, when people ask me, like, what, yeah, what, what should I tell say, them? You know, yeah. like, we're yeah. learning about all this shit that people aren't going to understand when mm-hmm. I tell them. So, mm-hmm. like, what's a dumbed down version? And they said, just kind of like the development, maintenance, you mm-hmm. know, of process control. Yeah, process control, and like, it seems like that's only going to be more and more required. Like the way the world's going and everything, you know all these automated processes, that's, well, that's going to be everything, right? That's the thing. In the States, like, you know, my, one of my best friends was down there. He's a petroleum engineer. Mm-hmm. He said they're looking for automation. That's what they call it. They're technicians yeah. everywhere because, you know, they're getting into more automated stuff Yeah, and they just, there's not enough resources for it. So it's a, they're not going anywhere. You can all, you can make machines do as much as you want, but you still need people to make sure those machines are, mm-hmm. Or you know, are calibrated or running yeah. correctly. Otherwise, yeah. it's just going to be a shit show. Especially when like you do get automated to a certain degree, which you see some of the warehouses down in the states and oh, all the automation man. that they have. But then it becomes like a like a, almost like a frack site where it's so automated and you get so much throughput and it's pumping so much money through that if something goes wrong, you're down a lot of money. If it's down for a couple hours, you can be a couple hours, a couple minutes, man. Mm-hmm. It's crazy mm-hmm. the amount of money. Like it's crazy. Like. You know, the oil field's coming back here, yeah. here and they're start, they're flying parts. They just fly down to Texas, yeah. pick up a part, fly it up, and they'll mm-hmm. hire the instrument tech to install it. And yeah. it's like right now they pay them big money for yeah. that. So I don't think it's going anywhere. Yeah, not a bad not a bad little industry to get into. Yeah. What uh what drew you to that? Was it just kind of looking at things like that of is it gonna be available lots of work there? Or is it kind of something that interests you the actual work itself or what kind of brought you down that path? Because I think last time we talked, you're kinda of kicking a few different things around. You didn't really know which one you were gonna Yeah. Do um well, when I retired from hockey, I was, I wanted to go into guiding with my old man yeah, and get into yeah. that family business and, you know, eventually start my own company mm-hmm, and do that. Mm-hmm. But COVID shut down the borders and right. take hunters and all that. So we didn't know how long COVID was going to mm-hmm. last. And, you know, I wanted, <laughs> to, like, I wanted it, to fill my time yeah, with something, yeah. you know, so I went to, back to school and I started in the winter term and they'd limit like power engineering. They don't start in the winter. It's only right. fall. So I was looking at that and I was looking at other, you know, engineering type, mm-hmm. you know, stuff and instrumentation just seemed like it kind of had everything and you, you couldn't be, um, how am I going to put, you couldn't be a dummy, you know, you had to yeah. have, so you, you know, yeah. you had to have somewhat of a brain to mm-hmm. like get through it. There's a lot of math and yeah. physics and science and, and, you know, I thought it would be interesting to learn and, mm-hmm. You know, I always heard that guys who are in instrumentation, you know, were successful if you yeah. work hard and all that. It's not just going to come, you know, you got to sure. work. But it just seemed like it was something that was pretty broad too, you know, like say oil and gas is on a downturn like we saw the last, what, five, six, seven years. Mm-hmm. Well, there's still, you know, pulp mills. There's yeah. still, you know, like I said, manufacturing yeah. plants. Like you can, there's a, you know, like there's some big jobs at the university making sure all their boiler rooms and all yeah. that, are, you know, work and like. Right it's a broad, you know, spectrum mm-hmm. of work. So I think that's another thing is just the ability to, you know, be diversified, I yeah. guess. Yeah. And the, and then the, kind of the skills you learn too with stuff like that, it's, uh, it's so broadly ap- applicable, but then also you just learn a lot about kind of how things work and how to almost, uh, how to think about those processes when you're doing anything larger scale than, you know, just putting something in one box to another. As soon yeah. as you get more complicated than that, you kind of, learn how to think about it. So you can always apply it to whatever you're doing. Even if you get into a different industry later, it'll be always exactly. handy skills to have. And especially like, like myself, I played hockey my whole life, yeah. you know? And yeah, my, my dad and my grandpa, they taught me, you know, stuff like, you know, shit growing up, but you don't learn a lot of stuff mm. when you just play hockey. Yeah. Like I know what playing with guys when I was say in junior, we get back from a road trip, it's minus 30 and my truck fires up, you know, Tacoma, you know, yeah, those things are yeah. going to fire up. And I played with guys who their truck wouldn't start and they did not know how to pop the hood of their truck. Yeah. That's how like baby they were, mm-hmm. or just like, like just centered around hockey yeah. so much. Yeah. They didn't know how to pop the hood of their truck. Mm-hmm. And it's like, 
going into this, like I didn't know a lot and, you know, I got a job last summer in, a, in an instrumentation, you know, production company. And I just learned so much about just like the industrial world yeah. and it goes a lot. You don't realize how much day-to-day life that this shit is like sure. valuable. Yeah. It's just valuable to have that stuff. And I think that gets lost, you know, living in the city, a lot of people don't, they just hire someone, you yeah. know, and you just <laughs> yeah. hire someone. Yeah. They don't realize that like it's, mm-hmm. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of practice experience yeah. to get good at that stuff. And I think it's underappreciated. For sure. For sure it is. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, is uh, the guiding thing still kind of in the back of your head, something you you, you think you'd want to do in the future if, if COVID does open back up and kind of let the, let the border open a bit more, get more Absolutely, of those? Absolutely, uh, yeah. Because that probably almost uh, disproportionately affected like the hunting industry because if you think about so much of the rules are based on if you're vaccinated or not, at yeah. least in Canada and so much of the guys that are down the, in the States that are big hunters, they're, you know, they're, they're laughing blue, in your face. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're blue collar rugged, you yeah. know, and they, it did affect it. And, and it's still, that's still, still what I want to mm-hmm. do, you know, mm-hmm. instrumentation. It was just, it's good because the guiding is, it's a very seasonal, right? Mm-hmm. So there's sure. a lot of downtime. So like to have a ticket in, in this where I can just, you know, go work for, you know, in the off season, yeah. non-hunting season, just yeah. go work and just make money that way. And then come back to guiding. It's, I think it's good to have, you know, like the double, there's just multiple things yeah. to do to be able to keep you busy, provide yeah. income. Cause mm-hmm. our, our lives aren't getting any cheaper. You no, know? Like no. Inflation and mm-hmm. there's fucking taxes all yeah. over. Like yeah, it's tough. It's hard to make a living, especially for, you know, younger people yeah. who are, who could afford a f- average house of five five hundred thousand? Yeah, like it's crazy, especially if you want to put a twenty percent or twenty five percent down payment. Mm-hmm. That's a hundred grand. Yeah, how the fuck? How's a, how the fuck's a twenty two, twenty three, twenty four year old going to be mm-hmm. able to afford that? Mm-hmm. It's crazy, it's, especially when they're all you know. It's, everybody thinks they need to do four to six years of school to, well, exactly. to get in there. So you're 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 coming into the game at twenty four years old just to now start making money. You might have a bunch of of, of debt from school exactly. like you are just so behind the eight ball and just the uh that traditional route that everyone's kind of get pushed down is all it's just squeezing and squeezing into this uh you know and, and i feel like a lot of it like they push the university route so much harder than a trade school for sure like i just read an article from from someone that um they're 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 lacking skilled workers now tradesmen and, and you know electricians plumbers yeah. people don't want to do that anymore they want to go to university for seven years and take a fucking arts degree. Yeah. They get out of their, they graduate with, you know, 60, 70,000 in debt and they get a job for 18 bucks an hour. Cause what do you have with an arts degree? Exactly. You know, like, yeah, good for you for, for putting the time in and getting mm-hmm. it done. But did mm-hmm. you think about what kind of job you can get after? Exactly. It's, it's crazy. Like you could be a professor after, you know, your, your career, mm-hmm. your career student or your career, like university just, yeah chill exactly and then and then it's a feedback loop because yeah you, you get this degree you're in your only option is to go back into the school and take more school or become a professor or whatever. and then now all the kids coming in are getting taught by these people that never that was my biggest thing with the business school at u of a not everybody there's some really great pros but a bunch of them you could tell you've never they actually have, done any of this they never ran a business yeah, yeah. You, you, know? have, you have your master's in, in in business but you've never actually done shit yeah and you can i don't know for me i felt like i could smell it a mile away and i just hated it I didn't want to listen to him. I could, I just have to skip all their classes. And then right before midterm, I just study like a bachelor and try and figure well, all the stuff that's going to be on the test. Yeah, right. You need to like, that's why I appreciate Nate so much more. Like, yeah. you know, some of our, some of our profs were in the industry for 25, 30 years and they were mm-hmm. tired of like the rugged labor, you know, you get yeah. older and they just wanted to take a step back and they were mm-hmm. good at teaching yeah. and you know, they're good at it and they have real world experience in for what sure. we will be doing. And, yeah. And that's, I think that's a big difference than, than uni where, you know, I mentioned earlier, there's 400 kids in your class. How mm-hmm. do you have a, a personable, you know, relationship mm-hmm. with, with those? Yeah. There's too many kids and it's just a meat grinder. Mm-hmm. It's just a, like, you just in and out, in and out. And you can feel it. It oh, feels like a meat sure grinder. Can. That's, that's sure. the thing. And they don't give a shit. Not a ounce. They pay your money and get out. Mm-hmm. And if you don't want to get out, just keep paying money. And that's yeah. even better. Yeah. You know? That's like, even they better. Love the, they love the lifetime mm-hmm. student because, mm-hmm. well, pay a lot of money. Yeah. And you see all these different, like, usually it's not big things, but just little things that push you towards that. Like, the, the when you look in business, they have certain classes that are requirements that are really hard that they almost, 
it's, it's a weeding out process too, but they always have like certain ones that they almost want you to fail to and, yeah. and to get more money. And it's when you look, I lived in on, on campus and residence and stuff and just how much of it is focused on the dollar and yeah. how can we squeeze more money out of these kids? Well, right. It's so mandatory. You need to take however many credits. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of those are outside your program. Yeah. I fucking took hockey class. Yeah. <laughs> And it was mad, like, I need to take credit, like, what the fuck am I mm -hmm. doing taking mm -hmm. a, or basketball or yeah. it's just so that they get more money mm -hmm. for your course mm -hmm. or, you know, I, I want to say like English is good to have, you know, yeah. like you need to be able to speak, you need mm -hmm. to be able to write, yeah. you need to be able to interpret, you yeah. know, stuff like Comprehension, that. Comprehension, all those things. But, but the way that they teach, it's a <laughs> fucking know. joke. It is. I watched in one class, I watched the movie Alien. And all it was was how alien the movie Alien was sexualized, and why is it? it I'm just yeah. like, how the fuck do you watch this and get this from that? I know, it's I know, crazy. And then it's you absurd. have to make some bullshit paper up about mm -hmm. it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what am I doing? Yeah, and like that was the thing that I really struggled with because I I saw the same thing. I'm just like, I, it was really the English classes that were the worst of it. But yeah, you're sitting there and you're, you know, and I'm sure you're the same way. It's like I know I can write this. I know I can write the paper you want me to write, but it's gonna like rip my soul in half because I don't want to, I don't believe any of this shit and I know what you want to hear. And it's like, ah, oh. so you're just sitting there like just pushing it, pushing it towards the deadline because I do not want to write this stupid paper. Not that it's going to be hard and I don't know, but I'm just going to have to absolutely compromise everything I stand for yeah. to give you what you want. And I tried earlier on in the university thing to, to try and push back and, and to fight against us and be like, no, and, and have it well dogged, well backed up. Like I'm pretty eloquent. I can make a point when I need to. Right. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter how good your points were. It was wrong because it was the wrong idea. Well, that's the, that's the and thing. then you learn. You just so either subjective, right? Yeah. And your yeah. prof, if, if they think one way, mm -hmm. here's an example. I had a prof in one of my English, my first year English class. We had to write a paper on Omar Kadar. He was the the guy who killed one of the U.S. soldiers over there in Canada. Paid him ten and a half million dollars, right? Because right? right. he was in Guantanamo or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, he should still be there. He killed an American soldier. Like yeah. he was 15 or 16 years old. I'm like, you know which you know where right, right and wrong. Yeah. And that was I was pointing that out in my paper, you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. that was my side. And right. holy shit, I had to have a. She had called me after class and talked to me about yeah. how I was wrong. Yeah. I said you told me to write me a, write a paper on my opinion of it, and yeah. I did. Yeah. That's my opinion. Like you fucking exactly. I was just fired up. I'm like. Why even ask for your opinion? Just say, I'll write it this way. Exactly. And that's, and, and that's what they're saying. They're not saying it with their words, but with their actions and with, you know, the, 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 the sticker they get to put on with, with the letter grade at the end of the year, they're exactly telling you that yeah. don't have an opinion, have our opinion. Yeah. And I just, there's nothing I hate more than that. And I was just four years of rage against the machine in there of just, you know, I got to get out of this stupid bullshit university. And I say that those four years of university, my funnest four years of my life, I enjoyed the hell out of it, but that was nothing to do with the class. No, it was, exactly. it was like almost, that was the engine of being so angry at what it was. It's like, I'm going to enjoy the shit out of this. And that was, it worked. Well, you see it like you see it now. Like, I don't know how they, they've done it through COVID. Like it would have been so hard that just like so much stress and there's no stress relief. Mm -hmm. Couldn't go out with your friends and have fun. You couldn't go to the bar. You couldn't hang out mm -hmm. with each other. Like I was at the UVA uh, hockey game in the playoffs the other yeah. day. They have the cups stacked like doubles, like two panes of glass full. Yeah. Like, like they were having the best time yeah. ever. And I'm like, man, that would have sucked for two years not been able to do mm -hmm. that. I feel like going to U of A and going to a Bears game at the Claire Drake on campus yeah. with all the Lister students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was so fun for us. Yeah. And yeah. it looked fun for, you know, everyone going. Yeah. Like it, sitting in the stands, it was great. I mm -hmm. was like, you know, they deserve this. This yeah. is what university is about. Exactly. It's not about grinding a paper out at four in the morning. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, that, that, that comes with it, yeah. but it's like enjoying yourself. Yeah. And, and I think you touched on something really important there and that I hadn't really thought of it like that, but in saying all that, you know, bullshit that I see in the university, it doesn't mean it's easy. It's still a shit ton of work and it's oh, hard yeah. and it's stressful because you have, it's, it's kind of bullshit work, but there's a lot of it and a lot of deadlines and a lot of actual volume that you have to get through. And it is stressful and there's times when like midterm season where if I didn't have all those, you know, parties and, and the dodgeball and Lister exactly. and, and, and all that bullshit, I don't fuck. I think I would have had a mental breakdown. Seriously. Like there was, there's no way I would have got through that. And to see how many people with all those things still mentally collapse, like I, I could name you 50 different people that I knew throughout university that it broke them at some point where they yeah. could not do it over it. And they had all those other things to go with it. 
right? Like that blows my mind, especially this. I don't know. I think we might've talked about this last time. I remember, but when I would see my friends in Lister that were on like the football team or something, we're doing not only all the school shit, trying to have fun and be part of Lister and then also going to like two a days for football. It was like, that is absurd. I don't know how you're doing it. Sometimes you'd see them in like early in the morning and they look like a zombie and they're like, yeah, I haven't slept in like two it's days. Tough. Like, craziness. It's tough. Like it was the most fun I've had playing yeah. hockey. Yeah. It was my two years at, at U of A, but I think so. Yeah. I sure. heard that Orlando solar bears has quite the, uh, that, that's that, when you play pro it's different, you know, yeah. like it's, it's fun. The schedule's tough, but it's it's just a lot of fun. I, mean, I, I played in cool spots in the yeah. states, you know, Orlando and Norfolk. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't get better than yeah. those places, but university is a bit different. It was so fun at yeah. university. Like you play for Saturday, you play mm-hmm. Friday, Saturday, and then you go out with yeah. the boys and you party, and, mm-hmm. and it's fun. Um, but it was a grind, you know. Like we'd have workouts first three days of the week and yeah. practice as well as class you get home at eight at night and you're like i don't feel like making dinner so i'm just mm-hmm. gonna eat some shitty food yeah. don't want to do homework because it's fucking already eight o'clock yeah. i'm dead tired yeah like, exactly it was a grind but it was so much fun man like it was so much fun it's funny how much those two things are tied to just like the most fun you're gonna have in your life are oftentimes like the biggest grinds you go yeah. through which is kind of just one of those weird uh parts of life but yeah I don't know, it seems to crop up all the time um, I had, uh, the only thing I knew about the Orlando solar bears or kind of that whole league was that you played for them. And then just lately on chicklets, I keep bringing that up yeah, about how they just have sponsored like, by, uh, Pink Whitney, right? yeah. And now, yeah. and, the, and they were, but they're talking about like the facilities and stuff they had down there. And they're just saying like in their day, if they got to play somewhere like that, was it same for you? Was that like one of the, the nights like for compared to that league, was it the facilities and all that oh, just next and next yeah. to none? Like for the East coast, it's a great league. Mm-hmm. It's gotten a lot better. Um, it is a development league for the American league yeah. and even for the NHL, you know, a lot of goalies go down there, right. NHL prospect goalies. Cause they'll start rather than be a third mm-hmm. or, you know, mm-hmm. back up in the A. So, but like we played at the Amway center, which is the magic rink. Oh really? Yeah. Like it That's was, sick. we didn't have our own custom dressing room or anything, but it was yeah. like, it was unreal. Like mm-hmm. huge, it would be like Rogers now Yeah. as an East coast team yeah. and Orlando is fun city. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was in Norfolk, it was an older barn, but it was an American League barn. So yep. it was a big, big rink. And we lived in Virginia Beach. Like I was a minute, I pretty much lived on the white sandy beach. <laughs> and That's it not was bad. like, it was awesome, man. Like it's, Virginia is a big military state. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it was cool just to see all that. Yeah. You could golf year round. That's always a plus. You know, it was, it was an awesome experience. I'll remember it forever. Like, yeah. I'll, you know, tell my kids mm-hmm. about it and mm-hmm. how much fun it was. And yeah, it was, it's just different than, you know, college. Yeah. Even when I was at UVA, we played, we went to Yale and Dartmouth mm-hmm. and we got to kind of experience that yeah. <laughs> after going there and we won both. I think we beat them like Yale five, nothing and Dartmouth seven, one or something. Yeah. They announced on the, like announcers, like, yeah, just so everyone knows they won their national title. Yeah. yeah. Kind of embarrassing. Yeah. They thought they were just going to slap. Us. Yeah. These Canadian kids coming but down. Then, like afterwards we're like, wow, this, we should have went NCAA. Yeah. Yeah. No <laughs> like, shit. It was, it was, it was like project X. Yeah. They had like the fraternity houses and, there's just like hundreds of people in the basement. Like there's DJs, yeah. big beer fridges. They have beer pong tables cemented into the ground. Just for, like, it was crazy. Yeah. I'm like, well, we just, we just make our tables, you know? Yeah, like, yeah <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We don't, we don't need a middle cement. Table. Yeah. Just yeah do just fine. All nice. I'm like, wow, this is, you guys got it figured out yeah. down here. And, and when we talk earlier about that being such an important part, you know, it might, some people might laugh at that of that being important, but that is part of the learning in like the university. The school part is almost auxiliary to that part and that growing. And what I hated over my four years of university, you could see them just trying to strip as much of that away. They didn't, they were trying to hide the drinking, like change all that stuff, thinking that was bringing them up like to the upper echelon of like what schools is. But like when you go down to the States and you see that, it's like, no, they get it. Like they get that. That is part of the experience. You can't try to be politically correct Mm -hmm. now, but Mm -hmm. that is like, that's just part of growing up. It's yeah. the experience you need to have, mm-hmm. I think, anyways. You yeah. know, some some people don't enjoy it. And yeah. like, that's all the power to them because, you know, they enjoy other things. Mm-hmm. But I think it's a part of growing up. I think you need to experience certain things. And yeah. and that was one of them. And it was it was just cool, you know, got to see that side, the States mm-hmm. versus Canada. Yeah. Like this how way the schools are run mm-hmm. and all that and their pro- hockey programs. And it was it was cool. Yeah. And then 
like you think it wouldn't be important to, but then if you're in any sort of any sort of profession, there's gonna be times where if you're that guy that was great in school, got all the best marks, but you don't know how to, you know, socialize, have, socialize, have a few drinks with someone, you know, ha- hold a conversation about something you know nothing about and just be curious. Like those are all really important skills that are going to actually help you in, in, in the workforce. Lot, they go a lot further than they make it, make yeah, it seem, yeah. you know, and, and, and a lot further than, you know, 90% of the classes you take, right? Like when I look at my business degree, there's like finance was good. Uh, some of the econs, like the earlier ones, you get into like the econ 400 classes yeah. are super pointless. And then like maybe the Excel courses, but all the HR bullshit, I haven't Marketing, used it the day in my life. Yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's baloney. It seems like a lot of common sense for me. Exactly. Like I, I don't know. I, I, me personally, if I see an advertisement or, yeah. you know, marketing. Do you want to just pull this uh, mic a little closer to you? Yeah. yeah. I'll see like the advertising or marketing. Yeah. And I'm like, that doesn't make me want to go buy it. Exactly. You know, like exactly. if I want it, I'll just, you know, like it's, whereas the real world, finance, accounting, mm-hmm. you know, even the stuff with Excel and stuff, that's yeah. very valuable to have. Mm-hmm. Like those I've used it a tools. ton. Yeah. Those are just tools that are just make you more valuable to yeah. a company or your mm-hmm. company. Mm-hmm. Or to yourself if you want to start it, something on your own. It's just a lot of fluff. It's yeah. just a lot of fluff. That's a good way to put it. It was a ton of fluff and that was frustrating. And it was like, if you can see that, if I can, if I can see that on day one walking in from the outside, how can they not realize that, that, oh, we could really tailor this down. Like the U of A business degree could be cut down from four years to like two and just give you the, the, the meat and potatoes exactly. of the important shit. And if you want to stay on and you know take those take marketing those, and hr exactly and strategic those. management bullshit like that <laughs> small. was small man i hated small like yeah. those were the t- the process like you've never worked in a day in your life if you think this is how it works in the world you fucking idiots yeah. and then you see people that have never worked just nose in their books just brown nosing with these profs just like sucking in this bullshit and you know oh your first two years out into the workforce are oh. going to be tough because if you believe this shit and think this is how it works you are in for a rude it's, awakening well i remember i remember we had my one accounting class managerial accounting we were on the curve right so yeah the grading was curved i don't know there's a couple hundred kids or 100 kids and i feel like they were studying for fucking a month before the midterm i think i, I got like 85 on the midterm i got like a b yeah I'm like what the fuck yeah. in finance this would be an a my finance, yeah. the fa- uh, passing grade was like a 45. Yeah, like, yeah. Just my, with the curve. It was crazy, man. I can, I can, yeah, I think I got a, a 55 on my first finance midterm. And I was like, holy shit, I'm going to have to drop this class. And I'm like, no, that's like a B minus. I was like, really? <laughs> like, oh, yeah. all right, we'll take that. Yeah, we'll take like that. passing was like a 45. I'm like, mm-hmm. wow, okay, finance is tough. Yeah, and it fucking was. Yeah. That was, yeah, that's probably one of the hardest courses I took and I think they make it that way like your first accounting course and your first yeah. finance course and I think it's to kind of weed people out that want to go into finance as yeah. a major but like all my friends that went into finance as a major said like no that first finance class is the hardest part like I remember like I only went I had two years at UVA and then I signed with Toronto but mm-hmm. I signed before school was done so I was like fuck I ain't coming back yeah yeah I remember I we won national so we were partying a lot yeah. and during midterms and all that and I went to my finance just didn't didn't even crack a book yeah. just went in guessed on every question yeah. you know I got 20 percent so I guessed you know I got yeah. I had yeah. one out of five chance of getting yeah. that I guessed how I should have mm-hmm. and ended up failing it and whatever I didn't go back to university mm-hmm. which whatever went, yeah went to Nate and signing yeah. with Toronto is kind of cooler than yeah. finishing out university I'd say you know, I was I was thinking oh, maybe I'll regret this later, but I just after going to uni, I just realized like it wasn't for me. And, mm-hmm. and Nate, mm-hmm. I realized now what Tom went, and I yeah. was like, wow, this seems so much better. Yeah, you actually get hands on shit. You you learn more. You're mm-hmm. ready for when you're done. Mm-hmm. You're ready to go to a job, not fully. You know, you still need the training and yeah. stuff, but like you can look at stuff and be like, okay, I learned about this. Yeah. Whereas uni, maybe not so yeah. much. I think Nate is like so much better like just there might be one or two things like if you want to be an engineer like if you want to be a doctor yeah yeah, medicine dentistry like Mm -hmm. those for sure exactly but But other than that they're very tough that's Mm -hmm. like those people are you know gifted you know they're smart they work hard yeah and you need to you need to put that time in because it's not a profession that you can just pick up for sure um like i played with a guy who was in medicine Really? And he would tell our wow. coach, like, hey, I'm probably not going to be able to make Thursday practice. Like, I'm pretty b- bogged down. Yeah. And he's like, if you want to play this weekend, he'll come to practice. The guy's like, man, come on. Yeah, come on. Medicine, I'm in med school, you know? man. Yeah. <laughs> like, 
come on. Yeah. But he he worked hard. He was a smart guy. Now he's a – oh, shit. He's specialized in something. I yeah. think he's an anesthesiologist. Oh, cool. So, like – Make some big dough doing that. Yeah, yeah. And, and he worked his he worked his nuts off for it. Yeah. And he realized hockey was a gateway to help him for get sure. to school, like get schooling. Yeah. You know, it paid for and all that. And I think that work ethic from playing, you know, a sport helped him for grind sure. through it. And now he's successful in doing that. And yeah. I think that uni for sure serves a purpose for that. Like those yeah. tougher fields. But there's a mm-hmm. lot of just like we mentioned, like, the arts degree. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what you, what you get from that. Exactly. And where and do you go? Nowhere. And if you love it and you're willing to understand that I'm not going to get anything out of this, but this is what I love. And, and and the experience of these four years and like the learning I'm going to do, that's worth it to me knowing like I'm, this is not going to pay financially. This is not going to pay off. Fill your boots. But there's this, this kind of bullshit line that everyone's being get been getting fed that no, this is going to, financially pay off if you get that if you have any sort of degree with that you know signature at the bottom you're you're gonna make 80 grand a year it's like no it's not even even a business degree like like my i played with the guy my buddy he graduated from with a finance major mm -hmm. played signed with uh, san antonio yeah was in the coast he enjoyed playing but he's like screw it i'm gonna go back to school got his master's he couldn't find a job for Mm -hmm. over a year Mm mm-hmm he got his master's and yeah. I was just like, oh, usually I figured, you know, like, oh, yeah. get your master's. But no, he struggled and yeah. now he's, he's got it figured out now and he's doing well. But yeah. like, it took a while. For sure. It's just, there's so many people going through. Mm-hmm. It's the supply and demand is yeah. just, it's, out, yeah. it's out of whack. Yeah. And it used, and it used to be where, you know, a very small percentage of people went to post-secondary education, right? Like that was, and. Well, you went and you were apprentice, you yeah. were, you know, yeah. like, well. Growing up in northern Alberta, you know, slave, like mm-hmm. pipe fitter, welder, yeah. you know, yeah. like, and then it was, there's a transition somewhere where mm-hmm. everyone wanted, you got to go to university. Mm-hmm. That's the only way you'll be successful yeah. in life. Go to yeah. university. Well, I know a lot of people that didn't, mm-hmm. and they are very successful, own yeah. their own businesses. They yeah. do well. They have all the life skills that they mm-hmm. need just from working and, you know, we're working hard and yeah. they figure it out along the way. Exactly. So. Like Ingo's a Red Seal electrician, right? Like he's. Is he an electrician? Yeah, he's a Red Sea electrician. That's how he started, right? He moved off the farm, went to the city and started, you know, yeah. wiring up buildings here, went to Nate and yeah. got his ticket and then went up for two weeks of work in Slave Lake, just like everybody else in Slave Lake <laughs> that went up for two weeks of work and, and never left, right? And that's, and like you say, the skills he learned going through that are broadly applicable to everything he's done since. And yeah. you can see where he learned all that, but at the end of the day, he didn't need a... Is he from Edmonton? No, he's from uh, St. Gudo. Oh, yeah, so just o- just outside, yeah. yeah. Grew up on a pig farm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, makes sense. Mm-hmm. Makes sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> and all all the math checks out. Oh, that's fucking funny. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. You mentioned something there that got me thinking. Um, you were mentioning your friend that was uh, kind of realizing that that hockey was kind of a means to an end, and he could really use it to to bring himself to a different place in in life, right? Through like med school and that. I'm curious, what percentage of like the players that you saw like have a really good perspective on where they're going. Like how many guys are just lost in the sauce and they think I'm just, I'm going to make it. And, and, uh, you know, maybe are a little bit out of their depths or are not realizing it. And how many guys kind of had a really good handle on, I kind of realize what, where, where I, where my ceiling is, what I'm going to get out to it. And, 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 uh, kind of have a, a good outlook on it because I, I would wonder about that of, of how rare that would be. I would say it's more prominent in junior, you know, when you're yeah. 16 to 20, and say you're a 16 or 17 year old playing in the Western League, you mm-hmm. think like, wow, there's only a few of us. Like yeah. we have a really good shot. It's yeah. like, yeah, you might have a better one, but there's so it's world like, hockey's worldwide, For sure. you know, and there's so many people trying to make it. Mm-hmm. I think once I got to uni, I think a lot of guys were playing hockey because you know they enjoyed it. They got school. Mm-hmm. They had more of a if I don't make it like. You kind of yeah. gave, I, like, I gave up the dream of playing professional when I went to school. Like, I was yeah. like, yeah, if it happens, it happens. If mm-hmm. it doesn't, I, I had a good year and I'd signed. And, but I think you have a better perspective on, like, your plan B. Yeah. They always say, yeah. make sure you have a plan B when mm-hmm. you're playing. Well, in junior, it's like, it's just a grind. You yeah. gotta, you gotta get drafted. You gotta yeah. go to the NHL camps. You gotta make mm-hmm. the show. If you don't, well, then you're kind of just sitting there like, oh shit, I just kind of, mm-hmm spent you know five years it's awesome you know you learn a lot but you need to like 
my parents were always, you know, my dad, he was like, make sure you, you know, work hard, mm-hmm. give it your all if that's what you want to do, but not everyone makes it. Yeah. And this might be, I don't know, I see this like, oh, you know, your parents aren't supportive if they tell you to have a plan B. No, I think they, yeah. I think it's the opposite. Exactly. I think they just want you to, you know, be realistic. Mm-hmm. It's very mm-hmm. hard. Yeah. Very hard to make it. Yeah. And borderline impossible. It's, right? it's, it's crazy, it's the, man. And it's, I think I always was like, yeah, if I don't, I'm going to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I enjoyed junior. I, you know, I would sneak out and go have beers and yeah. you know, turn 18 and go to the bar. You yeah. know, you weren't supposed to, mm-hmm. no taboo, but I wanted to enjoy it because I know mm-hmm. that it's not going to last forever. Yeah. And I want to look back and say, I enjoyed it instead of eat, breathing and sleeping yeah. hockey. And that's all I want. That's all I ever want. Mm-hmm. Like, I know I played with guys that were like that and now they're, you know, they're, I don't know if they regret it, but maybe, mm-hmm. maybe they think like, oh shit, I should have enjoyed it a little yeah. bit more. Should have smelled the roses a bit more. Yeah. So, so is that a, a big noticeable shift kind of like from, from that super grinding, almost like everyone's in that environment of kind of gr- grind, got to get drafted in the juniors. And then when you get out of it, so did it feel like a different energy, different yeah, atmosphere? 100%. When you, yeah. When I went to school, it was like, yeah, we took it serious. Like mm-hmm. we, for sure. Bay's, you know, prestigious program for hockey mm-hmm. you know, they have the most national championships yeah. it's they, they want to win every year mm-hmm. but it was you're doing something more you're getting an yeah. education while playing yeah you're kind of setting yourself up for the future outside of hockey mm-hmm. and there was it was a different feel but it was almost like you had less pressure yeah you know in junior yeah. if like if you didn't get invited to an nhl camp or something you're like oh shit you know mm-hmm. i had a tough year you know yeah. like what am i going to do next like mm-hmm. i need to have a there's so much pressure yeah and then in, that just lifted off a bit when you went to school mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, if it happened, that's, I think that was a big thing. It, it, it just lifted off. And then I had a great year and yeah, I ended up Cause you're not signing. planning anything. Yeah. I didn't make the NHL or anything, but shit, man, I'll, <laughs> you know, make money playing hockey. That's what, what yeah. more can you ask for? How many people can say that in the true. world? Yeah. You're, you're, you're 0.1% of the world can, you know, say it they, was, it was awesome. Like. Then I went to Europe, traveled the world, yeah. you know, saw, went to Australia and played in the USA, Canada, you know, mm-hmm. series, saw, saw parts of the world that I would have never went yeah. to anyways, yeah. you know, lived in Norway, Finland, UK, like why yeah. would I ever go to Finland? Mm-hmm. You know, like it's cool country, you yeah. know, different culture. It's looked like it, when you look outside, it looks very similar to Canada. It's mm-hmm. just, they do the same stuff. They hunt, they yeah. fish, they it's just a job. Did you get to do any, do any hunting over in Europe? No. No. I, uh, in Norway, so a guy on our team, his parents owned a house and they lived like underneath us. Yeah. And we had the top level. Yeah. And he was a hunter, but in Norway, you need to have a dog to go hunting. So you need to, you need to, it's a rule. So really? he had like this little like beagle looking wiener dog, <laughs> man, with a good nose. Yeah. And he would come back and they would shoot deer or yeah. like whatever else. And I was like, oh, man, we used to take Norwegians hunting all the time for, yeah. like, bears and moose. Yeah. And he's like, oh, man, that's awesome. Like, mm-hmm. I never heard. Like, they went over to Canada, and they were, he was a little older. And his English was very broken. But, yeah. like, we kind of, like, found found common ground just yeah. off that. Yeah. And then I went ice fishing with him there. And nice. Caught, like, perch and yeah. shit. Same shit, you know? Yeah. Like, I was like, man, this is awesome. Like, yeah. Feels like I'm back this, home. Yeah, we do this at home, and we yeah. catch the same shit, you mm-hmm. know? it's So that was... Norway is one of the most beautiful countries yeah. you could go. It's yeah, I awesome, definitely. That's man. on the like, bucket list. It's a cool spot. Like you, you can take a train from the bottom of Norway to the very top, like Arctic Circle. Like yeah, you could just take a train there, and there's like it's called Tromsø, and they have a music festival up there. That's it's in the summer, and it it runs all day because it's right. light there all day. Yeah, the sun never goes day, down. I didn't end up going. I wish I would have. Yeah. But it's it was just like. The infrastructure, like everything's clean, modern, yeah. people take care of themselves, mm-hmm. you know, like it was, it was a cr- really cool country. Yeah. It's a lot different than North America. Just that, that, that European well, vibe, whatever yeah, it's it is. It's not as fast paced. Like mm-hmm. people just go with the flow. Yeah. It's not like a rat race. Yeah. You it's get just, groceries for whatever you're going to cook for dinner that well, night. That, and that's a, like the grocery stores kind of remind me like a circle K or like a yeah. max, you yeah. know, like they're not big. You go mm-hmm. and you get your shit and you get out. Yeah. It's not like a huge. It's not like going to Costco. <laughs> yeah. Like they have like maybe one in the, <laughs> like the town I lived in, which was just outside Oslo. But that was when you wanted to load up. But yeah. otherwise you just walk down the street and go yeah. to the grocery store, get shit for that night. And, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's not like you're going, I guess, but. 
I guess that also comes with it's a smaller country. Yeah. Whereas yeah. Canada, like I think Norway might be the size of Alberta. Yeah. So like you can go through all the whole thing and it's just mm-hmm. smaller. You don't have to go as far. Right. Canada, logistically, we're limited because it's such a big country. Right. And that's another thing. Like in Norway, a lot of people drive Teslas. Mm. Well, here, <laughs> how are you, yeah. you going to charge it in red? You're going to Calgary, wait 45 minutes, yeah. charge your electric car. Especially if it's minus 45, yeah, <laughs> that battery's going to suck down pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, they got, they could drive in the bus lane and stuff. And, mm-hmm. but in school, we're talking about the electric movement and all mm-hmm. this. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be tough in Canada. Like minus, minus 30, yeah. a battery's going to die quick. Mm-hmm. If everyone has an electric car, there's not a lot of chargers. You're going to be yeah. waiting three, four, six hours to yeah. charge it. And you can yeah. only go 300 clicks. Yeah. The, the math doesn't quite work out there yet. And you know, it's, it's, it's a cool idea and all that, but maybe one day, you know, Elon's yeah. working on it. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's working on it, but yeah, I don't, yeah. I think people are jumping to, uh, the, they, they they look at it, see the long term idea of it, and think we're there now, yeah. which is so many things, right? Especially in that domain, and they just jump to it like windmills, and I mean, still, but especially when they first are making them, just the return on them are just absolutely terrible. You get ten, twenty years out of the things, and then they, what do you, you can't you can't dispose of them. There's just going to be mm-hmm, piles of mm-hmm. fucking shit everywhere. Yeah, it's it's, but like again, they just see they they get so caught up looking out into the future of of this world they want to live in this utopian thinking and then they don't realize the actual nuts and bolts of what's going to happen today well, think about like you see a pipeline in the you know you're out you're dry, quadding around you go mm-hmm. on a pipeline you know cut line just nice green you know it's cleared out it's nice animals yeah. can go anywhere where the fuck are they going to go on a solar farm? Yeah. Kilometers and acres of fucking black panels yeah. all over it. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. It's a, when you when you think of it in that, yeah, like of uh, of like the nature of it, it's ecological disaster on that front, like, right? We never think of it. So much, so you can't farm it now. Mm-hmm. No animals can live mm-hmm. there, so it's it could be crown land, but it's just covered in fucking black yeah. panels. Yeah. That you might as well put a big parking there. lot. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's like I've never thought of it in that in that frame before. And it's like, or you just go up north, find a find where there's a pipeline. Just a long mm-hmm. cut line with nice, you know, they can, yeah. they clear it so they can, you know, monitor it. Yeah. But it's, I, I just don't understand. A lot of the people that are pro, like for it, they've never seen one. Mm-hmm. They see pictures of probably mm-hmm. lithium mines that they're saying. <laughs> yeah, are yeah, 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 sad. yeah. Oh no, that's actually a lithium mine to make your electric bucket batteries. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's just devastating. Yeah. And then it's like they, they just they're so closed minded. Yeah, yeah, they just get so exactly it's that that. The well, utopian the thing it just locks told them in. It's better. <laughs> if we could uh, have a uh, a penny for every time you hear that on on, on some subject or another, you'd be a, a very rich man. The government doesn't give a shit about us. Nope, never has. When have they have? Yeah. yeah. In the history of the world, when have they actually cared? Yeah, not not have. anytime I've seen. Yeah. Um, just to circle back to that thing about the dogs, did did they give any sort of like logic behind it? Why you have a it's need? for tracking, so they don't want. They don't want you to wound, wound an animal, wound and, an all. animal mm. and just be like, ah, fuck, it ran too far. Right. You know, they want you to find it. Right. So that was, that was their thinking behind it. Like they don't want. Yeah. You which is like probably the biggest. Hunting, yeah. Hunting. Which is probably the biggest, like, uh, if, if you're, if you're educated and like that's hunting is another area where people are just so uneducated where someone's never seen a pipeline. Someone doesn't understand hunting. They just have this completely bastardized idea of what it is. But like, if you are educated, that'd be the one area where you could actually throw some uh some some reasonable some counters to it but most guys that love hunting are they're more worried about that than exactly. anybody else they right don't like, lose that. exactly and and just you y- y- you feel bad too you don't want to fucking you know like i i've got buddies that are you know accidentally fucking winged a deer and you know they they go out for three days because they're they they're feel fucking, bad they feel yeah. awful but they want you know just at least know that it you know it's, just want to put it out of this misery or whatever so that is another it's just so they're they're just everything's polarized now it's mm-hmm. binary it's mm-hmm. either you, you're this way or you're this yeah. way there's yeah. no middle ground mm-hmm. anywhere now yeah everything's been politicized too much where it's literally binary mm-hmm. it's a one or a zero yeah you're this way or you're that way where you know like i remember the old cecil the lion thing yeah people don't realize that those hunters pay a hundred grand to go hunt this mm-hmm. well that money goes into those those mm-hmm. people that sustainability that's their, there, yeah, yeah. That's their economy mm-hmm. and they use that for conservation to be able to keep poachers out yeah. to be able to monitor them mm-hmm. to be able to you know make sure there's a sustainable population yeah. of them like it's not like they're going out there and just shooting the shit out of it yeah. you know like yeah. 
they do that. They have a ranch somewhere and they just, you know, that's their Exactly. They go do that in Texas. They want to do yeah, that. Yeah, they exactly. Have a ranch. You know, yeah. they own all the animals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that, there's this, it's just, like I said, it's just binary. Thing. Yeah. No, yeah. there's no middle ground. You can't meet in the middle. You can't talk about it and be yeah. like, okay, I see your side. Yeah. Do you see my side? Yeah. Okay. And that's, and that's where I see it is that I think it's in the discussion because I think there is a huge middle ground. I think 99% of people are in the middle ground. If you ever get a chance to actually sit down like we're doing in front of each other and talk about things, everybody's more than more often than not reasonable. You get the, the, the people that get pushed to both sides and, and they kind of live in that world. But on the whole, I think most people are, but you're not allowed. They, for whatever reason, it's so polarized that you're not allowed to be in the middle. You have to pick a side. You have mm-hmm. to, there's only space for, for conversation and discourse on the, on the edges, which is nuts. That's to also me. social media is a big, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. people can say whatever they want when yeah. they're, you know, typing a tweet, you know, mm-hmm. but if you're having a sitting down and having a conversation, yeah. it's a lot harder to be like, no, fuck you. You're wrong. You're an idiot. Yeah. yeah. Like, it is. Well, you say that. Okay. Maybe we'll have to step outside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> people might be a little bit leery about mm-hmm. saying that, but mm-hmm. online it's like, ah, say whatever you want. It doesn't matter. You anonymous account. You have a hundred letters in your name. Yeah. 20 numbers no one knows mm-hmm. who you are and that's all every time i step into that social media world i'm always just thinking because it's been so proven now that a bunch of different countries just have like offices and offices of floor space that are just filled with people making fake accounts that are not yeah. that are not bots. it's it's it, but it's not even bots it's worse than that it's actual people because pretending to be bots exactly <laughs> pretending to be bots or like they're it's it's a it's not a real person because they they have an agenda. They're, they're programmed. They're, 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 they're literally they're, programmed by the people that tell them what to do. Okay, yeah. do this. Okay, yeah. sure. They're drones. They're walking mm-hmm. drones. Yeah. And so many people are just and, walking and you have, drones. And you have, you know, you have a office building. So you have a thousand people just sitting there all day, you know, t- making Twitter accounts. Stuff. They each got 20 that they're running. They're doing different mm-hmm. shit. Like the amount of the discourse that is not it's actually mayhem. It's mayhem. not real. It's not real life. Yeah. It's not real life. Mm-hmm. It's. It's their way of trying to get their point across to as many people as they can. And they mm-hmm. do that just through sheer numbers yeah. of saying the same shit mm-hmm. over and over. It's trying yeah. to program other people. Mm-hmm. And then they can influence all these other people, right? Like they're talking about influencing elections and stuff. It's like, that's the, not the least of it. That's a big, that's a big deal. Not, don't get me wrong, but just day-to-day discourse on stuff. Like you look at stuff like COVID and you think, man, so now they have the ability to push discourse whichever way they want just through sheer volume mm-hmm. and then you're using you're, you're you're making scientific and like societal decisions based on social media and and social what you media, think is yeah. the the way things are pushing things and then people jump to be on that side because there's this big seems natural upswell of of uh, support for one side or the other so people naturally you know a certain type of person will naturally just glom onto that to be part of the team yeah. and to not be the other, right? And then people pleasers, people pleasers, right? And then you and then you get a whole society that's going down and really, you know, kind of walking ourselves towards a cliff. And you wonder, hey, wonder, uh, wonder how much this is actual well, think, people. Think about like when it social media first started, you know, like MySpace, yeah, MSN, MSN Nexopia, Nexopia. You just went on to BS with mm-hmm. your with mm-hmm. your friends. Yeah. Now it's like. Well, you get your news, but how credible is the mm-hmm. news? You know, mm-hmm. you see all kinds of stuff. All oh, yeah. fact checkers are out. Well, who are those fact checkers? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. what are the, their subjective these yeah. fact checking? Yeah, and then you look at like, okay, these three years of these fact checkers, and then you look at their record on it. And it's, well, they've been more wrong than anybody yeah, else. They it's get like fact checked from like, yeah, it's crazy. It's it's brutal. Like to, social to look, media is it's it's gonna it's just leading to not a good place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's. It's not, and and it seems like there's a, a there's a better way to do it. And I know I, I listened to this podcast with a guy that's starting a he's trying to start this new social media called Minds, and it's got a whole bunch of things. But the biggest part of it that really gives me hope that there is a better way to do this is it's completely transparent with all their algorithms, everything that is like it's completely it's open, open source. source. It's yeah. open source, and I, and to me, and I think that's terrifying to all those people that oh, at, at Facebook, right? But that's what. I think eventually with all this that we're talking about, it's going to push people towards and it's going to create a serious hunger for something like that and that people can control. And, you know, if I'm going to put my time into Instagram or Facebook where I don't know what's happening behind the scenes, what they're trying to influence me, what motivations they have, who has bought ad space, who they're trying to push me to. And I can go somewhere where it's completely transparent, yeah. right? And you have a say in the people that are using it, have a say in how they want it to act and what they want to curate. I think another thing, there's so much, 
there's so many, like you can be anonymous. Yeah. I think a way maybe around that, I don't know. It's, it's tough because mm-hmm. some people don't want their personal yeah. info out there, but to verify yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm so, I'm so you torn know. on that because that was something they talked about with mine is to have some sort of, um, you know, you submit your, your ID yeah. so that your name is attached to whatever you say. Mm-hmm. I think that would filter out a lot of the, For sure. the, the hatred and the, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And all those, and all that bot problem of well, exactly. you know, having and, but 6, it's also Russians. like Then your personal information's out there to, you know, mm-hmm. data breaches mm-hmm. and all that. So yeah. that, that's where you got to, mm-hmm. the digital world is so complicated yeah. with that way. But I think that would stop a lot of this nonsense. This shit For sure. That's going on. For it's sure. Tough. There's like a, it's a fine line, mm-hmm. you know. Because that's where I, that's exactly where I get to too. And my head is like, it's so hard to parse out the the bullshit from the from the realness online in in any kind of space right and that's one of the ideas i had and and tying some sort of validation of that you are who you say you are right and then you can kind of start to have a track record of their opinions and you know you can kind of judge for yourself where they fall in that my biggest fear with it is just anything that gets close to a social credit credit score ever since i saw that first episode of black mirror all that time ago with that social credit like that freaked me the fuck out right and it actually scares me too man i've seen videos in china of this mm -hmm, guy that there's mm -hmm. a journalist he said some stuff that you know didn't follow the lines couldn't get a couldn't buy a train ticket Mm -hmm, they banned mm -hmm. him they you know readed his social credit score he's red yeah oh man that's a slippery slippery Mm -hmm. slope especially with how much is going online like right now like now they're talking about, uh, you know, what if they say, and again, with all the, the, the protests and stuff and people freezing people's bank accounts, what if, okay, so you're, you're not, you're dissenting from the, from the narrative and now we're going to not let you spend money. We're not going to let you, you know, if it could happen to someone else, it could happen to you. Mm-hmm. So right now mm-hmm. it's the other side. Yeah. Oh, but years down the road, uh Oh, now yeah. you, you believe in something that mm-hmm. is a little taboo. Now yeah. you're bad. Now. Well, I want to rewind a little bit. Well, yeah. shit, man, it's already in. Mm-hmm. It's a slippery slope. That's you just that's a, you just always got to think like eventually it'll shift yeah. to the other side, and then what, do you want that? Do you want to pull up Mike a little closer? Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you want that to be? Yeah. Do you want that to be the world you're living in? Yeah, right? you know, where you can... it could just shift, and now you're now you're the one who's mm-hmm. got can't fucking mm-hmm. go f- for groceries or go to an Oilers game. Or exactly. Anything. Exactly. Like. People often mistake this idea that they say, oh, if the if it's a justified cause for us to have this, this power, whatever the power is, you have to realize that at the end of the day, it's going to be people, just humans that are going to be the ones that decide. And eventually that could be a different human that decides that you're like, the power itself is what you have to worry about. The justification doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how justified. And I mean, COVID's a great example of this because everyone's just going along with all these things. Saying, it's just justified. And they don't understand that. It doesn't matter if it is justified or not. You have to be so careful with those things mm-hmm. because it's subjective what people can. And once you give them that power, they never give it back. Well, exactly. Mm-hmm. That's You see it. <laughs> yeah. They don't like giving that power up. They no. don't like feeling that. Mm-hmm. That's why Canada is just completely out of step with the world right now because they won't give any of those powers back, right? Like, yeah. I still can't get on a fucking plane right now. And that's no, me absolutely absurd. Me that blows neither. my mind. Sure. And like... That that really eats at me, and it's been tough these last couple years. Just like mentally, just to think of like I've strived my whole life to be a really good person, right? Like I fuck up all the time, but like on the whole, you know, I, I've never really done anything I'm I'm real ashamed of or nothing. I've tried to always be on the right side of things, and just because of some subjective decision, I'm now all these whatever words you want to throw at us. It, it's like man, that really fucks with me. Well, it says in our charter that we should be able to go to from mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. a- anywhere in Canada. Well, if we can't, we're screwed. Yeah, just because of this. It's yeah, such a polarizing topic. You know, some people mm-hmm. aren't going to like to hear yeah. it or whatever, yeah. but that's fine. People haven't agreed forever. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's the beginning of time. They've, yeah, people have disagreed. Yeah, doesn't mean that they deserved less. Mm-hmm. Like we're literally rolling back to like, yeah. like, oh no, you think that way you can't do this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like we fought for so long to get <laughs> away from that. Yeah, exactly. And it's like we're going backwards. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The regression is, is, is amazing. And not, not only is it regression, but it's regression in the name of, um, you know, forward thinking in the name of, uh, you know, progress. And it's like, yeah. how can that, like, it's so. Everything's inclusiveness. Exactly. Until it's not. Mm-hmm until it's a, for someone who thinks a little bit different than them, then they're not included. Yeah, exactly. Then they're excluded. Yeah. And it's extreme now too. Like mm-hmm. It's not like, 
oh no yeah just go your own way you know do what you want mm-hmm. it's like yell scream mm-hmm. take away mm-hmm. your shit yeah bury them dehumanize them right yeah, and, bury and, them. and that's the thing and, and I've, I've said this a ton on the podcast uh, uh, over the over the last couple of episodes so apologies if people have heard it but the first step before every major atrocity from the start of time since we came out of the trees has been dehumanizing the other, right? Mm-hmm. Like before every war, before every Holocaust, so before blame everything. Blame someone. Yeah, blame someone and dehumanize them so you can you now have the free the freedom to do whatever you want to them because they're they're less than you. They're yeah. they're 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 substandard, right? And that is a dangerous, dangerous concept. And it's just been thrown thrown around willy nilly for years now. It's like, man, if you don't see that giant red flag waving in the wind, I have some questions for you. Yeah. You got I your know. eyes shut. <laughs> And you could try and have that conversation, but if they're not open-minded, you know, I say there, but yeah. you know, it's both sides. Mm-hmm. People just have their mind closed to certain stuff yeah. and they're not, they don't have an ability to like hear the other yeah. side and, you know, be like, Oh, maybe that, maybe they're thinking this way because of this. Yeah. It's just like, no, you're wrong. Yeah. And that's, Shut up. and that's so, you know, within human nature to go to that, e- go to what's easy, Dreams, right? Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and just to, it's work to try and listen and understand the other side. And it's probably going to cause you some, if you're, if you are on either side and you, and you've really attached that identity, you've made that part of your, 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 your personal armor that protects you about the world is I believe these things that's going to cause you a little bit of pain to have to go and listen to something from the other side. And you might have to sit with that, but it's so much easier. And when there's an easy option, 99% of people are going to take it. Yeah. But to me, it's, I don't know. I don't want 99%. I want the 1% that are going to actually do that, right? Those are the those are the people in my circle. That's the people I want to hang out with. Those are the people I want to have on this podcast, right? Like those people that are a little bit braver than your average bear, yeah. right? Like I could, you know, the world needs all types of people, but you definitely don't have to. Uh, well, think, imagine if everyone thought the exact same way, mm-hmm. liked the same things, mm-hmm. disliked the same things. The world would collapse. It would, what, what, what kind <laughs> yeah. of world, like what would it be? Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, what, what is that? Mm-hmm. You don't have no debate, nothing, yeah. no innovation then. Cause mm-hmm. you don't think outside the box. Exactly. You just go with the flow mm-hmm. everywhere. Everyone's the same. There's no laughter. There's yeah. no jokes yeah. because there's no comedy. Well, at you all. think the same way, yeah. you know, like exactly yeah, yeah, jokes funny, but this one's not when it's actually fun. Like it's, mm-hmm. it, it'd be walking drones, yeah. no emotion, nothing. Everyone's the exact same. Mm-hmm. Think about that. That's, and, Awful. And, and it seems like that's the world that they're trying to push people towards. And that's almost take out sports. If you, everyone thinks the same way, they have the same sports team. Yeah. Everyone cheers for the same team. Mm-hmm. Well, why have the other ones? Yeah. You know, You're yeah. Not gonna, I just don't, I don't get it. Like you can't, no one thinks the same way. So why are we trying to force everyone to mm-hmm. think the same way, mm-hmm. whether it's through censorship or whatever else? Yeah. It's these algorithms that they put out so mm-hmm. that they shift the focus on the one thing yeah. and everyone has to believe that it's and, and and my biggest idea of you know and again this gets down a little bit of conspiracy rabbit hole it's it's not not to me but you know everyone else the way they're going to hear it is is that to me the reason they're pushing everything towards that is that they don't care what you think as long as you're not questioning the actual structures that are in place and the people that are making a lot of money off of it right who are people who are the people yeah. pulling the strings yeah, exactly and every and they and the people pulling the strings what they love it when everyone's fighting right versus oh, left because sure. then they think oh that's this is the whole game it's right versus left and nobody realizes it's no it's 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 it's, it's, it's you know one percent versus yeah there's a very select mm-hmm, group mm-hmm. that enjoys this yeah and they don't want us to get along yeah they don't. This is all conspiracy stuff, you yeah. know, and I go down that hole too, but it's nice to talk about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> get and it that, out there instead of just reading it all day and just yeah. pent up. But yeah. They don't want us to get along. Mm-hmm. They don't. Mm-hmm. Like exactly when you saw a couple of years ago, like it was, you know, not done very well and it was kind of a bunch of people that just wanted to kind of yell and scream, but that uh, Occupy Wall Street stuff, that was scary for some people of because the, they were asking some really, really... Uh, daunting questions that they don't want to be answered and they really put went full force into really enforcing no don't don't look at it as you know the elites versus the 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 haves and have nots don't look at it through that lens it's left versus right and we're gonna put all these things in place to really enforce that narrative because as long as people are fighting within themselves like you know the 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 average joe the 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 average 99 percent of people that on that make up both left and right that whole dynamic that is completely you know almost it's not artificial because it is there, but it's enforced and it prevents them from, prevents people from actually asking questions and really well, knocking on the liked, right doors. That's why I like, 
the trucker convoy. It was such a polarizing yeah. thing, but you saw it. everyone, like a lot of people there were from different walks of yep. life, different races, mm-hmm. different mm-hmm. jobs, different yeah. political backgrounds, everything. And they were dancing, having fun, you know, like enjoying themselves. Exactly. Finally, and they hated that. They hated, they wanted that shut down as quick as possible. Because that was exactly showing that this, this, this right left narrative that you're just trying to push down everyone's throats. It's not really that true when people get in front of each other and can talk and, and yeah, then you're like, wow, we agree with a lot more than we disagree mm-hmm. with. And we didn't know that it's yeah. all disagreement before, but it's yeah. like, wow, shit. And you take a step back and look, it's like, mm-hmm. we actually agree on more stuff than we disagree with. Yeah. And they didn't like that at no, all. Not at all. Like, yeah. It was, it was nice to see, you know, you see like every, t- t- every type of person there mm-hmm. and they were having mm-hmm. a good time and, yeah. you know, like f- all striving for the same thing. They yeah. were like, oh shit, you know, mm-hmm. we can't have this. Yeah. And what was, they, they, there was definitely, oh shit. But in my head, I thought, but what are they going to do about it? They wouldn't be that stupid to, you know, actually, you know, like I didn't know, I didn't it's easy to say this in hindsight, but I didn't even think about like enacting the emergencies act well, yeah. or freezing bank accounts like or world, going to go fund war me. stuff. It's like, like that. Hell? And, and I never would have even thought that would be on the table. And I kind of figured all, all it's going to take like in my head, I thought, you know, all it's going to take is for it to get to the, the, I didn't envision it being a trucker protest, but some sort of General mass strike. Or yeah. Something yeah. Just some, some sort of civil disobedience that was going to show that, what they're trying, the narrative they're trying to put that everyone's on board with this. If you think differently, you are, you are the other. And it's like, yeah. no, no, no. Like that's well, not at times the reality. Over the couple of years, I felt yeah. kind of like mm-hmm. there wasn't a lot of us. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, wow, man, maybe like we're alone here. But mm-hmm. then you start, you see online, you're like, no, there's not. Yeah. And then you see that and you're like, wow, there's more than mm-hmm. you think. And it's mm-hmm. like, gives you a little bit of, yeah. a little bit of hope, a little yeah. bit of, you know, yeah. you feel good, optimism. Mm-hmm. And then they crush it by showing the, the absolute power that they can wield, right? And it didn't completely crush it. It just kind of was like, oh, man, this is going to be a lot longer of a fight because you keep waiting for that turning point to be hit where people are going to start to wake up to the, you know, it's the powers that be. And it doesn't matter. Like everyone, the only part of the, uh, like the trucker protest that, that I didn't like was the, the fuck Trudeau stuff because I, I would yell fuck Trudeau louder than everyone. I really dislike the guy. But I think... If you think that if the conservatives were in power, that this would be all that different, you are completely, well, that's the completely thing. I've in noticed for... a change in tune lately mm. because that's, that's what they do. That's what politicians mm-hmm. do. Mm-hmm. They don't give a fuck. They just want to pick up on things that is going to get them mm-hmm. reelected mm-hmm. and to get paid their big bucks and their pension. They yeah. don't give a shit. Yeah. They just, now you see them. Oh, where the, the unvax can't travel and oh, Bitcoin, you know, one side's Bitcoin, one's not mm-hmm. or crypto. It's like, where was this two years ago? Mm-hmm. You know, where was this? Yeah. We just let it slide until now. Mm-hmm. Why? It's crazy. Like, I don't get it. Yeah. And that's, yeah, no, well, that's uh we are where we are because we were all complacent mm-hmm. and not, yeah. not a we or yeah, I yeah. guess we, but like the politicians, they were on the same side until yeah. now. Yeah. When they exactly. see a little traction being gained, mm-hmm. oh, now now this is our chance. Yeah, yeah. It's like they just stick their finger up in the wind to see which yeah. way it's blowing, yeah. and that's where I think it's dangerous. Is so much of politicians have done this for ages and ages Ever. and ages, stuck their finger up. They're just about re-election. We know that, and like the fact that people put any sort of stock and think that this is an issue of one side versus the other, like that's ridiculous. But now that act of sticking their finger in the air to see which way the wind's blowing. How's that happening? Through social media. Yep. And that is where, that is the biggest farce bullshit. You never know what the actual narrative is. Like yeah. it's so controlled. A, you know, all the algorithms of what's being pushed to the top are completely opaque and you don't know what they have interest, why, why they want to do this. Like if they, I'm not saying they're doing that. I'm not, you know, I'd probably lean towards that. But even if you don't, it doesn't matter if, uh, you know, if it's not, if it's not transparent, it's dangerous because well then you don't get both sides you, you don't get both sides but you don't even know what they're pushing it seems like just when you look at what rises the top and what narratives are allowed on social media what gets censored what doesn't it seems like there's a there's a there's uh, a definite bias yeah it seems like there's a bias right and you can say hey it seems like there is a bias there and and then you know the the tech companies go no there's not it's like well, well you're the one d- making money off of exactly. it. exactly you're the one making money of it but 
it's not transparent. So you can say, no, it's not. Well, if it's not, then open up your, yeah, make it open source, show us. Exactly. And the fact that they don't, it's like, well, it doesn't matter if you are or aren't. The fact that you're not willing to show it and that you're going to keep that. And they say, well, oh, that's propriety. Why they do crypto. And, exactly. It's all on the blockchain. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. If you don't understand crypto, it'll, this will be a, yeah. a weird thing to try and understand. But everything is in a ledger where mm-hmm. it transferred mm-hmm. to this wallet, yeah. to this wallet. To, you see yeah. everything. Exactly. And that's, and that's, they and, don't like that. And I get why you, you need cash, you mm-hmm. need physical, you know, you need to physically exchange goods for goods. Yeah. You need that. Otherwise it's society doesn't function. Well, there you well, like we were talking earlier. Okay. Well now you're on the red, your social credit score is mm-hmm. red. Boom. You mm-hmm. can't move. You can't use money. They freeze your account. Yeah. Shit. Now I can't pay my bills. Now I'm freezing in my house cause mm-hmm. it's minus fucking 35 here. Yeah. You always need that physical, but it's also good because everything I think it's politicians especially get them just you, the, let them make them use crypto tra- like watch yeah. every transaction yeah. they have mm-hmm. there's a big story going on in the states right now with the old laptop yeah and there's a lot of money being exchanged mm-hmm. around with politicians big money yeah well who knows if anything will even come of it because fuck probably not because they all play they, they they're, it's all it's so corrupt but mm-hmm. we think we live in this fair world it's mm-hmm. there's a lot of shit stacked yeah. against yeah. certain people and certain groups and yeah uh, maybe getting a little bit too far down yeah, i don't know it's it's, it's interesting stuff, but like when you say um you know crypto and blockchain technology that's exactly what that that minds that that's new social media they're trying to come i mean i talk about it so much i should probably actually download the goddamn thing and get on it and see what it's like my, myself but it's it's all built off blockchain so it's all exactly what they say it is and it's unable to be changed so you that's what gives it that trans that uh, that thing is with that is it there has been like hacks and stuff like mm. there's very talented people with computers that mm-hmm. can get into that so there's mm-hmm. always I, I think it'd be good if you could have both yeah you could have both you have that side and you have the physical currency side you know cash right. you know yeah getting away from the gold standard wasn't a good thing like, no you need something physical backed otherwise you see what's happening now they just print cash yeah. digitally oh. And, and what's, what's even fucking worse about it is I just read this uh, article. He's my, one of my favorite journalists, uh, Matt Taibbi. He used to write for Rolling Stones. I just subscribed to his Substack and he's just an awesome investigative journalist that really breaks down lots of shit and always comes with receipts and really backs his stuff up. And he was talking about, uh, the feds, um, and, and the Federal Reserve Bank and the stimulus that they're putting through. And like, there's this big story. People are starting to wake up to the fact that, uh, these politicians like Nancy Pelosi and stuff are making these big, you know, world changing decisions and then they're 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 investing and knowing well, that they buy the stock outcome. before it even happens. Exactly. But now they're sitting now what he was breaking down is these people at the Federal Reserve banks that are before these big chunks of stimulus going, they're they're doing these huge asset buys because when you put stimulus it's pretty much, you know, uh you make money on how much assets you have, right? Because, you know, if you own a whole bunch of houses, you know, you're going to pump the stimulus and the housing market's going to go crazy. Exactly. Right? And you see them just making these crazy, crazy amounts of money off of it. I saw something the other day of all like these U.S. politicians that mm-hmm. just suddenly bought oil and gas stocks mm-hmm. kind of right before this Russia Ukraine yep. thing. Yeah. When oil, oil has gone up a lot. Mm hmm. Whoa, these are the greenies that are pushing this fucking, yeah. you know, these are the mm-hmm. people that are pushing mm-hmm. for this green energy. Yeah. Why are they buying Exxon? Exactly. Chevron. Exactly. Why are they buying this? Well, they had a fucking head start. They got mm-hmm. a, what is that? Mm-hmm. They know this. They know the government's going to bring this in. They vote on it. Yeah. Why the fuck are they allowed to buy this shit before it comes out? It's absurd. It's absurd, like, right? <laughs> what is that? And, and that's, and it's not like, oh, oh, that's the, that's the liberals that are doing it. It's, it's every everyone, single one of them, right? All it's, of them, both and, sides. And that's why it gets me so riled up that... Like fucking so, Lockheed Martin stock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Raythorpe Grumman, like these mm-hmm. military Raytheon, stocks. Raytheon, yeah. Like, they bought them before all this. 100% Whoa, they did. fuck, how did we know? Yeah. Why do you just go out and decide to buy Lockheed Martin? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some serious questions. Unless the government's planning on buying a whole bunch of fighter jets from them. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe they are, you yeah. know? But yeah. we're a month, two months ahead of this, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's some money to be made. It's absurd. And like, that's the stuff that that's what really gets, uh, gets a guy because for a lot of this, it's not cut and dry enough where there's proof. Like that stuff is there's receipts. It, oh, exactly. It's they not, have this to. isn't conspiracy. This is like actually happening. You can go look it up. You can see yeah. because there's disclosure acts that have to show these purchases they make. And that's the part that gets me is 
just gets swept under the rug. Yeah, they know it's going to be disclosed. They know there's going to be a bit, but nobody's going to do anything Nothing. about it. That's what gets me. It's like, man, how confident do you have to be in your seat of power when you can just go throw it in people's faces like that and know there's going to be no consequences? Pelosi's got to be one of the worst. One of the worst, right? Like, I don't understand how you could be a career politician. Here, that uh, Arden, whatever, her New Zealand... Prime Minister. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She had a net worth of like 800000 or something a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. It's like $25 million now. Yeah. The yeah. fuck happened? How exactly. do you make that much? Stock markets mm-hmm. haven't gone crazy. Okay, sure. Maybe she bought Ethereum and Solana and mm-hmm. yeah. crypto. Yeah. That's the only way you can make that much. Those kind of returns, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like those returns don't come from the stock market unless you're buying biotechs that mm-hmm. go up thousand percent. Exactly. Or you have some serious insider information. I ha- why is why does Pelosi? Oh, I love this one. Obama, Pelosi, all these green, you know, these people of yeah. global warming. The fucking the oceans are mm-hmm. going to go up hundred feet, ten feet, and we're going to be flooded. Yeah. They buy beachfront properties mm-hmm. on the mm-hmm. fucking ocean, yeah. man. These twenty five million dollar houses, yeah, and well, making four hundred grand a year. What the fuck? Yeah, I know. It's How, absurd. On a fucking politician's wage, mm-hmm. are we? seeing multi 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 millionaires exactly and like just the questions that that should lead to the natural questions the investigation and the accountability that should be there there should in an unbroken system there should be accountability systems that that is there to check those things so okay why okay florida has been open for they might have shut down for six months started covid maybe six months six weeks why do all the why do all the democrat or liberal politicians go holiday there Mm mm-hmm well, fuck, their their states are shut down, mm-hmm. masks and yeah. lockdowns. And, yeah. well, let's just go to Florida for a vacay, Miami, you know? Or mm-hmm. let's just buy a house there so that yeah. when I absolutely bury, like, Pelosi's district, San Francisco, I bury it in fucking shit so it mm-hmm. turns into a shithole. Well, I'll just move to Florida. It's fine. Yeah. Everything's fine yeah. there. I don't, like, well, how do people, how are people okay with that? Yeah, it's it's exactly what we talked about. This The, the, the thought that politicians have any sort of care for the people is they don't give a shit about us. Don't give a shit. And that was And nothing. that's why you, people hated Trump. He wasn't a career politician. Yeah, he was a businessman. He mm-hmm. said what he wanted to say. Yeah, sure. Yeah. He had a, I don't know, people didn't. He had some narcissistic shit, yeah, right? Like, like yeah, he, yeah. He, he, fucking, some people are like that, but like mm-hmm. he, they didn't like how he wasn't a career politician and came yeah. in and actually got shit done. Yeah. And yeah, you, when you say get shit done, people are going to be like, oh, what did he get done? You know, he's a fucking mean tweeter. He's yeah, mean. Yeah, he he says, said mean things. He says bad stuff. Yeah. I've never had one person be able to actually like tell me things that the, other than mean things. And like, I'll give you that too. But on the grand scheme of things of in that position, is that really what he should be he judged? called out or? politicians and they would turn it around and try and make him seem like a bad guy. Yeah. It'd be like, I don't know. People try and compare like Kevin O'Leary in Canada to be like run for prime minister. Mm-hmm. And it's, I don't know if it's the same, but you career politics. Do you go to school and you get, get a degree in politician? Mm-hmm. No, these people, they, they shouldn't be a career. It should yeah. be you owned a business or you just care enough about your community mm-hmm. that you want the best for what they need. Yeah. You listen to them and you say, okay, this is what majority want. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, yeah, they'd say that, oh, yeah, our elections, you know, like, yeah, majority wanted this, the liberals. Well, just came out that Elections Canada said there was more ballots mailed in that got lost or didn't get counted than the difference in, in the win of, for, you know, like, the yeah, yeah. What the fuck is that? 200 yeah. and some thousand were just not counted. They were late or something. Yeah. Like, they just put it out there and people were like, oh, whatever, you know. Yeah, what are we going to do now? We're already <laughs> past it, right? We're, and And even to talk about that, you just get... You get labeled as all these different things if you even bring that up, and it's conspiracy like conspiracy yeah. theorist. Mm-hmm. That's a big mm-hmm. one. Well, they racist. They seem to, you know? yeah, <laughs> right? They seemed, like, well, the conspiracy theorists have been right more than mm-hmm. you know. They exactly. It all out there. They literally had a plan at the start of COVID, a leaked email of mm-hmm. what's going to happen quarterly. Well, yeah. here we are. Here we are. Exactly. And and then to not have that come out, have all these you know, call them conspiracy, just call them whatever you want that have seen a little bit behind the curtain and then for them not even to feel the need to change tact and to, to, to make it a little bit different. No, we're going to go still, it doesn't matter if the script's out there. We're still going to walk it through because there's no, 
actual there's no accountability there's anywhere no, yeah and there's and there's no threat to their power right like yeah. that's the same thing with these politicians buying all these stocks with insider information knowing that it's going to be disclosed that they did it but it doesn't matter that's what are you going to do about it grateful that my parents and my coaches and teammates they they you learned accountability you mm -hmm. needed to have it mm -hmm. you need to have that yeah. semblance of you know you have a conscience of between right and wrong if you're in the wrong you take you you, you you're accountable for yeah. what you do yeah what, okay, so inflation's highest it's been in 40 years. Yeah. Okay, well, why don't we just introduce a carbon tax yesterday, 25% increase. The same day, all the politicians get a raise. Mm -hmm. What the fuck is that? Mm -hmm. How does that work? Mm -hmm. Do people know that? Yeah, maybe they read it. Well, mm -hmm. why do they get a raise? They haven't missed a paycheck. And yeah. Small businesses have been shut down, restaurants mm -hmm. shut down. Mm -hmm. Oh, they got government uh, programs for them. You think that makes it up? No. Do you think those people wanted to start a small business so they can get fucking government handouts? Yeah. No, they didn't. Exactly. And, you know, it doesn't solve the problem if there's no, like, they think that business is just, you know, dollars and cents, but like you have to build up a reputation, have people there's come so and enjoy much it. And that go into build it. connections, right? Like you have a restaurant. Okay. So it has to be shut down for two years doesn't matter what kind of substance it's not going to survive. Even no. if it does, you are so far now behind the eight ball because you, people don't know where you are. People don't remember if you have any good food or not. Like you haven't been able to build it like that. Th there's so much that goes into it. And that's, and the fact that, you know, the, the big, the big, uh, box stores like Costco and all that never, never shut down. And it's actually, you know, if you want to go down like the 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 biggest conspiracy rabbit hole of them all of like BlackRock Capital that oh, owns fuck. almost everything. Everything they were invested in before, like all the military companies, all of not didn't take a I hit. I would at suggest all. people who whoever listen look up BlackRock. It is and absurd. look up their board, look up who's involved. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of connections with people yeah. with BlackRock. Yeah. That you're just like they have trillions of dollars mm -hmm. in assets. They pretty much own everything. They own everything. And, like and piece of crazy Pfizer, Moderna, right? all those, all those companies. They have huge holdings in them. You know, like Amazon, all Costco. It's, it's all, crazy. Like, it's they a, pick and choose who makes it and who doesn't for the big, like the big corporations. It's absurd. And, and uh, what I thought was very, very funny was BlackRock has never came up on a Joe Rogan episode almost in its entire history, which I thought was just kind of odd. And I thought maybe, cause Rogan seems like a kind of smart enough guy. They probably he, own Spotify. So then, um, Adam Curry, who's this, he's, he's an OG in the podcast game and he doesn't give a fuck. He talks about whatever he came on and he kind of laid this all just like you did it. And really with receipts and talked about it. And he told Rogan, have, have someone from Blackrock on, Blackrock on your podcast and talk to them. Well, and then uh, you'll have a lot of answers to questions. What's that? Edward Dowd. Yeah. I don't know who that I, is. I think it's Edward Dowd. Could be wrong, but he was a uh, higher up or not higher up, but he was like an ex like investment guy for BlackRock. Yeah, and he came out and he's starting to spill the beans now. Oh, really? Well, he's the one who came out and said insurance companies are the ones that are seeing like a forty percent increase in uh, like deaths among a certain age, age group, eighteen to forty five or yeah. whatever. And he said they're the ones that are going to blow this whole thing up. Mm -hmm. And he was with BlackRock, and he fucking must have said some stuff yeah, or yeah. maybe he left on his own. I'm not sure, mm. but he's kind of been spilling some beans about yeah. BlackRock and mm -hmm. getting into that. And I was uh, pretty interested in that. Me too. I think it's Edward Dowd. I'll have to look on yeah, my phone. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, lo I'd love to hear those. But that was why. So then for the first time I heard it on the biggest show in the world really laid out exactly that. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. And then sure enough, the next two weeks after that, that's when all those hippies came out of going to Rogan, all those, those, those clipped yeah. up things. And they just went to the full when Neil Young is going to take him oh, off Spotify. And, stuff. and guess, Young. and guess, guess who owns, uh, uh, like the biggest chunk of Neil Young's catalog. Probably BlackRock. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Like it's, it's hilarious when you, once you start to see it, it's hard to not see it ever because they're so, their, their, their fingers are in everything. Yeah, of course. Let's go okay. grab a piss quick. Yeah. It's fucking, I haven't had a combo like this. Before. Yeah, I know. It's, you never get to have a combo like this no. with anybody, right? Like it's so many people are just not informed, not informed. And, and to me, I totally get that. Like of, I'm, I'm obsessed with podcasts and I listen and just that, that, that podcast space is made for people to, to talk about past the first couple layers of shit and get down to these things. When you, when you, when you fall, like something like BlackRock 
it's in, it's at the base of so many things that if you listen to people talking in depth about certain subjects, it's going to come up and then you hear it come up time and time again, right? Like I had heard that name and I'd always kind of heard, but again, I, I try so hard to stay out of like strictly conspiracy theory stuff. Like I don't watch any YouTube videos of it. I only, the conspiracy theory, like things that come into my realm are all through like podcasts that I trust and I just let whatever trickles in. But until that Adam Curry podcast with Rogan, which I'd recommend people listen to if you want to hear, or even I'm sure there's a clip somewhere of just like maybe the 20 minutes where they talk about it, where if you just want to watch that, but he breaks it down, like everything they're into, who holds the power. And it's like, holy shit, that's that's some scary shit. The thing that I don't, like I I know the conspiracy theory and the the whole Rothschild thing comes into that Black Rock and that they own all the Fed, all the Feds in the world, Mm. all the like, federal reserve of mm-hmm. israel mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. uk yeah that whole rothschild thing like i don't know that conspiracy like if that all yeah but the black rock thing mm-hmm. they own it's, uh, they don't own but they have majority yeah. assets yeah where they have heavily the power, invested you know mm-hmm. in a lot of shit yeah majority of the, like the biggest corporations in the world yeah man. yeah it's okay tell me this they they own a lot of moderna moderna's never had a product that got approved they were like 0 for 8 or 0 for 10. Mm. Well, the first one that got approved was their COVID vaccine. Mm. Well, now they're coming out with a shingles vaccine. Well, a, like shingles has been more prominent now in the last couple of years or yeah. a year. Like what, like this, those are just things like, I don't know if it's, those are just red flags for me. Yeah, yeah. There's okay, questions so a company that never had a product approved before gets approved emergency authorization use for a COVID vaccine. Okay, sure. Well, a you know, side effect of the vaccine has shown to be shingles. Mm. Well, now they have a shingles vaccine coming out. Yeah. Well, what the hell's going on here? Are they just going to, did they just create a whole bunch of side effects where they have the solution to them? It's an, just an never ending money wheel, you know, they're just going to yeah. continually have products where they make money off of them. Yeah. And it's, and there's a, there's a percentage chance. It's probably not a big percent that. Just coincidence, right? It could be. Could be. But there's some questions to be asked. And that's what I don't like is when there's red flags of that are so clearly, okay, there's some questions to be asked here. And the response is, you can't talk about that. Don't even ask. No. Don't even talk about like bringing the questions up. It's like, okay. Don't be a critical that red, thinker. Yeah. That red flag just turned into a red fucking giant sale to me, right? Yeah. Like that's every time because if there's nothing to hide, you could just ask those questions well, today. Yeah, of course. No, this is complete coincidence. They, they'd have no problem talking about when they shut down conversation or not. That's well, when that's my ears thing. perk up. Yeah. Like... I don't know. There's just so many coincidences mm-hmm. late. Mm-hmm. And I maybe they're not, you yeah. know? You know, there it just seems like there's a a, a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. It's it's such a touchy subject because it's all based around COVID and this vaccine yeah. and and everyone's and, and so I I have so many friends, families that mm-hmm. you know took it and I I pray that I'm wrong yeah. and that all this shit is mm-hmm. wrong. Mm-hmm. It's just like there's – at what point is there too many coincidences yeah. Yeah. where it's like, oh, you know, maybe this was brought on. Mm-hmm. And not even like to me, like not even like the coincidences, it's the things that are now proven of like through leaked emails and yeah. things like that. Of, and and even like the leaked tr- – the biggest thing for me is the leaked trial data. For their oh, trying yeah. so hard to not show how they ran the trials for these vaccines. It's like, 75 years they wanted us to wait? That's Yeah, that's what the FDA Why was the trying to push. Why the fuck would we wait 75 years? Because it's terrible. Like when you actually look at Nine how they ran the trials. pages of side effects of single spaced like eight font. Yeah. And like even even like to, to take it back, like even to, to just be as cautious as I can with it. Like even if you take away the results of like the side effects and the things that we're seeing, if you just look at the data of like even if they were completely safe, there was no side effects at all. I would still be fucking pissed at how they ran the studies. Like yeah. the amount of people they ran them on is so low. It's like like less than ten thousand people. And now like, they're wanting only, six month old to two yeah. years old. Like, and they only insane. they only ran them on on healthy people. They they completely cut out the elderly from the study, which is who the vaccine should have been for. If they yes. play, they should. If there was, uh, if on the first dose there was. Um, Adverse effects. They cut them from the study, and they didn't get in the study. And they didn't. And they, and they didn't include that in the statistics. Like, there's so much wrong with how they ran those studies to begin with. That, and to get to, I always try and do, like uh, this is idea of uh, steel manning, right? You've probably heard of straw man, a straw man argument. So you mm-hmm. steel man an argument. You try and 
find out the best way of like what it is. And you see how reasonable that sounds like, okay, well maybe they thought we need these. We believe that it's, it's, it's going to be good. Like I'm trying to give them as much benefit of the doubt. Like these are going to be great vaccines. We need this. People are dying. Like let's just fudge it a little bit because we just need to get these through. And I'm tr- because most people aren't evil. That's where I get to is like, I don't think there's people that are sitting there trying to fuck people over at the end of the day. I think they just rationalize and the human being is so good at rationalizing things that they find ways to still think they're doing the right thing. Yeah. And when you can zoom out or if there's accountability, like you said earlier, if there was any sort of accountability added into the structure, it wouldn't happen. It, yeah. It'd be way different, but when there's no accountability at all and that gets down a whole different rabbit hole and of how this medical industry has come in, they, they don't even, people think that they do uh they do a trial, right? And, and, and um, then it gets sent to the, the FDA or whoever is, is approving it and they look at it. That's not how it lives. They do the trials. They come up with their, they do their own analysis. They make their own breakdown of what they th- see of it. And then they hand that to them. The raw data isn't given to them for them to make their own conclusion. They make their conclusions and they send that off and that's what get approved. That's a huge issue. And then there's all sorts of other um, regulatory capture where people are going from, you know, they work at Pfizer, then they go to the FDA, then they go back and forth. It's people on the, like these, there's always people on certain boards mm -hmm. that are making these decisions. Right. Well, there's people within the FDA that were former Pfizer board members or presidents. The majority of them, right? It's like, how how is that Mm -hmm. not a conflict of interest? Exactly. You worked for these companies and now you're Mm -hmm. working for the comp, like the, like the association that decides if these companies yeah. get their products approved. Mm-hmm. And and that's where I always, and that's, this is where I always like to take the, the uh, conversation. Like when I'm having this, because it is touchy, we don't even need to talk over Go like, go back well, to anything, like, go to go 2020 and back and then look at how this operated. And those same things, those same errors are getting in place. And there's these huge lawsuits get put because they put through drugs that are who's not the biggest, safe. Who's paid the biggest fine in history? Pfizer. Pfizer. Yeah. Yeah. They paid the biggest and fine. Moderna's no better. Every big Moderna, this is their first product that's ever went to yeah. market because it's the first one that's got approved. And and that and that's saying something because of how captured the the approval process is, right? And when you see people break that down, it is absurd. But just the, the thought that like the first time I heard that, and I thought that must be bullshit. There's no way these um these pharmaceutical companies get to do this, do the do the trials, come up with their own, you know, ways to because. If anybody's ever taken a statistics class, it will blow your mind how powerful statistics are. You can make anything look like anything. Yeah, with you can stats. manipulate it so easily. Right. So then knowing that, they get that ability. They can now take this raw data, massage it, however, to make it look as good as possible, and then hand that to the regulars, and then that's what they're making the approvals on. That is fraudulent. That is scary. Yeah. Right. Now you take that out of the out of the realm, like not even not even to talk about vaccines, but just like heart medications and, uh, well, it, and it's anything. And, it always, you always see on stuff, you know, you read the label, mm-hmm. not FDA approved or, you yeah. know, FDA approved. It's like, why are we talking about these ginseng pills? FDA approved. This is a natural root that grows in the ground. Right. You know, why do these have to go to FDA? Yeah. You know, like they decide if you get, to take something, if you get to buy something or yeah. not, otherwise it's black market my, shit. My, my biggest one where I was, you know, just absolutely raging against the machine was the FDA holding back, like at the very start of the pandemic, even before vaccines were even on the market, rapid tests, they were not approving rapid tests. Everything had to be PCR. And that was such bullshit when they knew they were saying, and they were, and again, trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, just saying, Oh, well, there's, you know, some false positive rates. And it's like, have you seen what PCR technology, because the, the creator of PCR, you probably saw the clip yeah, when he's yeah. talking about Fauci and how mm-hmm. he's a fraud. And mm-hmm. the, the creator of the test said you can make anything show up positive. Yeah. And I knew this way before um, so start before COVID because... An, an African country tested a papaya with a PCR and it was positive <laughs> yeah. for COVID. Yeah, exactly. Well, fuck does that work? Yeah, and, and, and you know exactly how it works because it's, it's just an exponential cycles. number. It's, Put the cycles up to over 28 or 25. Yeah. Boom, you got a positive. Pretty much. And that's and I knew that because in MMA, they've had a huge issue with false uh, false positive on, on their drug, drug test. test you, yeah. you saw it because they're using this PCR technology and they were running these cycles that were so crazy that were finding like these, like John Jones, the picogram, right? He yeah. got caught for a picogram of whatever it was. And they're saying like, this is like, nobody's ever heard the term picogram. It could be, years. Because, it could be a, you could have taken it years and yeah. years and yeah. years, but or, or, body, or you could have, or there could have been like a speck of it in the air that landed on your tongue yeah, or whatever PCR it is. PCR will find it because it's, but yeah. you just have to cycle it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They, they, you, you set the threshold. Yeah. 
to over a certain number for, for say this COVID over a certain mm-hmm. number. Whereas if you're testing for drugs or something, you ha- there's thresholds. Yeah. And the guy who created it, who's passed away now, he talked about this. Mm-hmm. I love that clip because he just shreds Fauci. Yeah, yeah. And he calls him a fraud and he's just a shill for the mainstream media and the government. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck, man, this guy, if, he, if only he was still alive. Yeah. You know, like he could just bust it all open with yeah. this shit. Yeah. Did you see that Luke Montagier guy? That name kind of sounds familiar. He's a v- virologist. He just passed yeah. away, I don't know, a few months ago. Mm. He was the guy who kind of brought up this whole HIV thing right now. You know how this... Right. No, I do. I know exactly who that, were, uh, who old, that is. Yeah. old guy. Yeah. I think he's French. He got, he got a Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize in 2008 for... Yeah. for uh, he isolated the first HIV strain mm-hmm. as a virus. Yeah. And he just said, you know, <laughs> just kind of just raise some light on some mm-hmm. weird shit's going to come yeah. out. Yeah. And he's dead now. Mm-hmm. And they, and they complete because he got on the wrong side of the narrative right before he died, he was a celebrated oh, yeah, scientist. Oh, yeah, Nobel Prize. And then, Ivermectin and, won the Nobel Prize as well. Yeah, and, and they just completely dumpster on this guy. Like in his his uh, eulogy and shit, they call him, you know, they pretty much paint him as just this this, or, this crackpot, this crank. Because was he, Ivermectin on the, the Nobel Prize? Yeah, Ivermectin won a Nobel Prize. Or the Prize. creator. I think it was those, the people that first synthesized it. But it was synthesized way back in the... Like the 60s or something. Yeah, so like that's just why. a taboo yeah. thing yeah. too, but it's billions of doses mm-hmm. for people and it's mm-hmm. all of a sudden not good. Yeah, and that's and that's something I was super high on like way before it got, because there was a time where it wasn't demonized, but it wasn't in the mainstream. But yeah. like, because I listen, like I've talked about on the podcast all the time, but like these two uh, evolutionary biologists that I absolutely love, um, I've listened to them for, for years and years. And they were they were the ones that were seeing the data because they're doctors and they talked to other people and they were seeing the data come out in India and uh, all yeah, over India, the world. India, that one province was a big yeah. one. Man. Uttar Pradesh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it they pretty, pretty much, much just eradicated it. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. even Rogan says on his podcast, "This is what I took." Yeah, this is what all your politicians took. Yeah. Well, why aren't the people mm-hmm. allowed to take it? Yeah, I they took it when said, I got COVID. They said it out loud, mm-hmm. like, and people are like, no, no, if I can see, it's, you know. They said no, you know, yeah. fucking the news, CBC says it's bad. Yeah. It's for horses and mm-hmm. livestock for worms. Well, yeah, yeah, it is, but there's a human dosage yeah. that's antiviral. Exactly. And you try and buy it here and you got to jump through fences. I got some ordered in from, uh, I think it was India. I just found it online and got it ordered, got it through the first time. Then the second time tried to order it, got blocked at the border and they took it and they got sent this big well, letter like, saying, you you know, it's illegal to order. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm just trying to, it, it, like there's no. Let people make their own decisions. That's yeah. what I, it's, it, we're being, treating people like children. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I found it funny now that you say that because the mayor in Edmonton said, Kenny was treating them like children by trying to introduce legislation legislation where they couldn't uh, make mass mandates, man, yeah. you know? Yeah. And they said, well, you're treating us like children. And I was like, well, that's ironic. Yeah, no shit. You're trying to yeah. mandate adult, like people mm-hmm. to wear masks, mm-hmm. which is treating them like children. And you're saying your government's treating you like children. Yeah. I'm just like, fuck. And, and, and just mandates on, on the whole, like even when you take a step all the way back to the start of it, mandates are ridiculous because if it was actually the the science should speak for itself or not that's again brings up more bullshit to say the science but if something is useful enough that people should want to do it they should want to do it right same with vax like to try and mandate someone to take the vaccine you know if if they believe in it they you should want to take it now you're mandating it now like, there's a ridiculous. lot of people like people don't like to be forced some exactly. people yeah they do mm-hmm. lots don't yeah yeah, I was I was kind of uh, you know going into it I, again. Was listening to uh, to those uh, two evolutionary biologists a lot on this, and just kind of getting their take on things before I made decisions. And what they were saying is, you know what, like vaccines are amazing technologies. mRNA is new. We're we're just going to sit back and see how it goes and look at the data. And that's where I was. I was like, yeah, that seems pretty reasonable. I'm going to sit back, let other people get in, and just ask lots of people, and seemed like everyone I talked to it had a not everybody, but a good majority had some you know, it's complications or we're sick for a couple of days and it just like, Ooh, I don't know if that's well, really worth it. And a lot of, you, we say like, Oh, this MRNA t- vaccine is, is new and it is, but it's been around for a long time. They've studied it for a yeah, long time. They've been time. using cancer research it, and you stuff. You know, like yeah. Robert Malone, it's, it's mm-hmm. been out for a long time and, and that's the other side's argument. Oh, it's been around forever, but it's never been put into practice. Yeah, yeah. They've never tested it and it's never, 
on large populations. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just stick to the old school, you know, like yeah. the mumps, measles, rubella, you know, yeah. from the egg. They mm -hmm. grow from the egg. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't like this new shit. Uh, yeah. I, I, I was, I just wanted to wait and see. And yeah. now that I've waited, and, you know. Yeah. And, and I got to see, and that's the thing I was waiting and seeing that. And, and it got to a point where I almost, I was almost about to get it. And then they came out with the mandates and that was the one I was getting. Now I'm not. Yeah. As soon as you went to that, that is. I was, I, then I, I was like, oh, okay, maybe the Novavax cause it's. Uh, like old school mm -hmm. tech and mm -hmm. stuff, but I'm still like, at this point, uh, the only reason I would be doing it was because I've had it. I didn't. I, I've me had too. a fucking fever yeah. for a night, and I was done. Yeah, why took my I, ivermectin, and I was fine. I'm healthy. Like, yeah. why would I? You know, it doesn't stop transmission. Exactly. It doesn't stop you from getting sick. Mm -hmm. So what does it do? They say it stops hospitalizations. 37 percent of Alberta is triple vax. Thirty five percent of the hospital are triple vax. And and all this and all the studies. So now to stop hospitalization, right? Like this is the thing that gets me is now like that was what they were basing it off of, like that it stops hospitalizations, right? In the in the in the initial trial testing. That's where it came out from, right? And they knew There's been that. more deaths in twenty twenty one than twenty twenty. But, but you didn't also include any old people in your trial. So now those are the people that would be hospitalized. So you just take a bunch of young, healthy people, give them the vaccine, they get COVID and then they don't They're get hospitalized. Fine. It's like, well, would they have been hospitalized without yeah. it? Like it's just there's so much issues with it that just and the fact okay, that and, I, and they were so worried about ICU capacity. Well, how many fucking billions of dollars the government dish, mm -hmm, dish out mm -hmm, for COVID? Mm -hmm. Not one fucking bed was built. Right. Exactly. They didn't in, in mm -hmm. increase capacity at yeah. all with billions. What did they do? It was spent on advertising for a fucking pandemic. Yeah. If we were in a legit pandemic mm -hmm. like Spanish flu, where yeah. 20% of Europe yeah. or 30% of Europe was It'd be dead. like a war. It, it, people would be dropping. You'd be like, holy fuck. We yeah. need to like, this is legit. Mm -hmm. Man, I don't know. There was, they, they keep coming out every day with new shit saying, oh yeah, our numbers were 60% of people hospitalized had COVID. It wasn't yeah. from COVID. Yeah. Yeah. They were, it was with COVID, mm -hmm. not from. Yeah. Okay. Well, that seems like a big issue. Yeah. How many were in there from COVID? Not with. Mm -hmm. You know, someone gets hit like a car accident and they pass away. Mm -hmm. Or has ter terminal and they cancer. Had, and they had COVID. Okay, well, did you count that as COVID death? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But like that kid, man. You remember that in Alberta? The Hinshaw was saying that one kid passed away. He had a a, a brain tumor. Yeah. And the family came out and was like, yeah. yo, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Easy. This is horse shit. Mm -hmm. It's tragic. Yeah. That our, you know, our family member passed away, but you're not going to use this yeah. as some gaslight yeah. for your mm -hmm. shit. Do mm -hmm. not. And they yeah. had to retract it. Yeah. And I all, like, I'm happy that the family did that. Yeah. Because going through that would have been awful. Mm -hmm. And their headspace would have been so, you yeah. know, you know, just such an emotional state that they were still able to be like, hey guys, yeah. you're using this for your mm -hmm. own benefit. Don't yeah. use our family member's yeah. death. Mm -hmm. for your own benefit yeah i just think that's such shady work mm -hmm. and i where's your conscience exactly and where's their conscience where this whole it? time why are you using a young kid's death mm -hmm. to try and scare people fear monger yeah. people mm -hmm. into this shit like that's just and i think that's why that, it makes me feel so skeptical of this yeah. why do they have to do that yeah and and i think you know it's it's probably again of just them saying I, I've rationalized this as in my head because in my head of balloon stuff is like, this is life and death. We need to use whatever, you know, morals aside, we need to use whatever we can to push this narrative because people are right. That, that are so far down the rabbit hole. That's where, where I get in my head. But like you talk about the billions of dollars they put and they didn't put towards ICU beds. If that was the big, that was concern, the main, right? that was the main argument that, for how long that was right? the only argument, right? Like yeah. that. that and, and that was the only argument that I went to. I was like, yeah, no, that does make sense. You know, if, if we are getting overrun with ICU, but why are we not investing in it? But even one more step too is early on in the pandemic, if you would have taken those billions of dollars and just put it into rapid tests, so there's rapid tests everywhere. Everywhere we could have gotten to the point where every person in Canada could rapid test every day. So that you could almost kill the disease right there because you'd actually know who had it and you wouldn't let it spread. Right. Like there is, but how accurate are those? those they're false, not, they're not, but that's, yeah. a, but that's the thing is even if you have a false positive, it, do, it doesn't really matter. It's, so much of the issues and the suffering that caused around COVID was the response to it. So now if you get it, you're not even going to get that six, but now you have to be isolating for 14 days and all this other bullshit, right? Drinking hand sanitizer. And shit. Everybody's so worried about it, right? Like even if it wasn't taking it every day, but just to, to go to a hockey game, right? Like I think 
that it's hard to make the argument now because we're so far in it. We're so over all this bullshit and all, any other measures. But if you can try and put yourself back in like the first couple months of it where everyone was pretty scared. There well, yeah, it was unknown. It right? was unknown and nobody really knew knew all that much about it. And we had these tests that for, for they sure are not. They were videos in China of people just dropping in the street. Yeah, and I was, we yeah. were like, what the hell is this? Exactly. And now it comes out like that was just mm-hmm. fucking mm-hmm. a lie. And, and, and now, yeah, this, this rapid testing seems like it'd be another big inconvenience. But if, if that could have curtailed all the other bullshit we've just done for the last two years, if like we just would have really heavily indexed into that and got us out now, because the fear would have went away because the big fear was, we don't know who has it. Um, and there was a big, the uh, big thing at that time was the, uh, um, uh, not asymptomatic spreaders and stuff, right? Like that was the big fear. That's what was scary. That was keeping everything yeah. shut down because they're saying, you don't know, you could be spreading it right now. If everybody's testing all the time, now that fear goes away and the fear is everything, right? But that's the thing they did. That's well, why the keep, FDA is trying to fire it up right now. They're, they're trying to get everyone wave. scared, right? And that's the biggest thing is we need to get people unafraid. That's the only way this changes. People need to start. So to- we're two years in, right? Yeah. And they're just talking about a sixth wave now. Mm-hmm. So that's three per year, right? If my math works. Sounds like a fucking seasonal yeah. seasonal thing. Yeah. Okay, so year three, we're probably going to go into the ninth. Yeah. Year four, the 12th. Yeah. That's just, mm-hmm. if we keep calling it a fucking wave, just creates hysteria for each one. And then, oh, the but That hysteria the wave, makes so much money. Oh, the, the, the hysteria the, makes all the money. Exactly. And the that, clicks, the mm-hmm, clicks. Mm-hmm. And, and, and people throwing on, you know, the, the watching CBC to watch that, that COVID counter go up all the time. Like, Nobody would want, everyone's so over in the news, but it's the only thing keeping people there because there's a lot of people that are, you know, probably unreasonably so, but they're scared, right? So they, they, they're looking for- I would say if for, you want any news, don't watch the news. Exactly. It's anti-news. It's, it's fucking embarrassing. It is. Journalists aren't journalists anymore. Mm-hmm. They just go ahead and run whatever their boss tells them to run and yeah. that, that boss has someone higher up mm-hmm. and then eventually it just leads back to BlackRock, <laughs> the, the BlackRock, <laughs> Pfizer, yeah. the yeah. governments. Yeah. It's, it's Klaus it's Schwab. Oh yeah. The old Schwab. Hey, that guy sounds like a super villain. Just his voice. <laughs> yeah. He's just not a guy that looks like he's uh, for the greater good. <laughs> no, not at <laughs> all. Look hey. at him. Not at all. All this shit just makes you want to build a cabin in the synthetic woods. Synthetic meat. Yeah. You guys are allowed crickets every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Only electric cars so that if we need to shut you down, we just hit a kill switch and your car doesn't work mm-hmm. anymore. You can't fly anywhere. Like, fuck. But your VR rig is going to be banger. Oh, man. Have you seen the movie? Uh, shit, I think we Red, talked about Ready this. Player One? Ready Player One. I haven't one. yet. I, I know. You still need to watch it after that. Watch yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's, that is how I envision this is going to happen mm-hmm. with this mm-hmm. VR shit. People are going to be so tired of their real life that yeah. they're going to throw on these goggles and it's a whole new world where... Yeah. They have jobs and shit, and they mm-hmm. get to do it's it's the alternate universe. Like yeah, I think Spielberg directed it, so yeah, it's I think a good he did. flick. Yeah, yeah, it's if you're into that. I just uh, so same concept, but uh, and I think when we talked about this last time, I think I brought this up too. Is just these uh, sci-fi books that I read, and I actually had the authors on the podcast too, which was really cool. This is one of my favorite ones I did uh, so far, but they have that as a major plot point in this, this kind of future dystopia. And like they always, you know, the future dystopia is always like, you know, nuclear fallout or whatever thing, yeah. but it was actually like a VR collapse where the, exactly ha- what you said happened of everyone got into VR, but it got so good that the entire society, everyone went into that and they started, it was, it was a zombie around. land in real world. Exactly. And, and everyone they just, just wanted to get into yeah, VR. And, 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 and then everyone's dying. And then it's just like, like the, the world population collapsed down to a certain amount of people and, uh, you know, a couple of people up in Alaska kind of repopulated the world and kind of brought it back out and it changed everything. But then they're like, have super, it's like the super futuristic world, but they have very strong edicts against anything that gets close to VR because they got to see like the horrors yeah. of the past and every, and it's the way it's written. It seems so inevitable just with human nature that that's, what's going to happen that every time I'm terrified to death of VR. Right. And everybody that's read those books, I almost like, it's just, you want to, everyone wants to live a different life. They mm-hmm. want to, some, and that VR, you get to decide. Mm-hmm. That's the, like, you know, we get to decide our own future here. If you want to work hard, if yeah. you want to strive yeah. to whatever you want, the tools are there. We live in a, a world where we can. Mm-hmm. 
But this VR thing is just, it's easy. Yeah. Everyone wants the easy mm-hmm. road. Yeah, everybody does. And that's, and it's always, there's it, always the technology's danger. Technology's not there yet because it's, it's getting still, close. but it's, it's getting weird, mm-hmm. man. Like it's so realistic. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. And, and once it's a feedback loop too, because the more people get in, the more money that's in it, the mm-hmm. quicker the pace of change is going to go. Right. And it's just going to ramp up and ramp up. And then, you know, the, the rate of VR change from 2022 to 2023 is going to be, you know. And who's a big company in VR? Facebook bot yeah, or Meta, yeah, Meta, Meta now. Yeah, fuck. I don't trust those guys. To... This whole Metaverse thing, you know, I got into NFTs a little bit, just mm-hmm. playing around and everything seems to revolve around this Metaverse where you buy NFTs and you get to use them mm-hmm. in this Metaverse. And yeah. I don't know, man. It just seems like it's leading there. Facebook changed their name to Meta. Yeah. You know, it's just, it mm-hmm. seems like they want to push us there. Yeah. And, and, and it's either they want to push us there or they see the natural slog towards it and want to get there first to be able to capitalize i would on say it. anyone who doesn't know about this whole thing watch ready player one yeah it's it's like a, a movie that'll kind of give you a perspective on where things are going yeah well maybe maybe you know maybe. It, it seems like there is an avenue there yeah. you know but obviously still need the real world you still need to eat you still mm-hmm. need to drink you yeah. still need to you know have energy that's exactly what collapsed the society was that people, people like weren't eating because it's just straight mm-hmm. vr mm-hmm. like they're oh. just dialed and it's, and it's and it's like a drug and they the, get addicted exactly and the writers are so good like that's what it, it affects like it still affects me to this day like i've read the books a bunch of times but they write it so good and like oh i almost want to like just find the chapter and get you to read it. Just like the one, like the two chapters that go around it because so in the, I don't want to spoil the book, but like uh, in that society at a certain age, like when you're a kid, you're like, you reach 10 years old, you go, everyone has to, in the society has to go to this VR museum and they have the old rigs and they take you through and they go and they kind of put you in that world back then. So you get to go through the experience. So like the main character goes through the VR collapse through VR, right? And that's what scares everyone away. And that's what keeps everyone off it. Oh, but yeah. it is so fucking visceral. But that's, what we sort of do, like we you, did with school. We brought up our history of shit, bad shit yeah, that happened, yeah. you know? Now we're kind of... Yeah, going away from one of race history and not We're erasing it, it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that we can almost mm-hmm. redo it, mm-hmm. you know? Like, once yeah. you start disregarding what yeah. happened and saying, oh, no, that didn't happen yeah. that way when it did, mm-hmm. that's when you get into trouble, yeah. you know? I think. So yeah. it, the book seems like... That if they keep doing that, if they bring back that history. That's mm-hmm. that's what they need to do to so, to stop history repeats itself. You it know that you know yeah. the quote: "History repeats mm-hmm. itself." Well, if you delete history, it's going to repeat itself, because and you won't see it coming. Yeah, that's the big thing. And like I've been uh, listening. To, I mean, I always listen to Dan Carlin. He's a historian. He does these historical podcasts. He does like ones on like World War One, on like Genghis Khan, oh, man, and I stuff. love World War Two in color on oh, uh, man. on Netflix. If, love that shit. You, you should listen to the World War One. It's it's like a six they're like five hour podcast and there's like five parts and it's like super and he takes you through and he's just so good at like you just getting raptured and it's one of the best things i've ever like joe rogan always says it's uh it's it's embarrassing to even have to call what dan carlin does a podcast because it's so much more than that like it's 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 like a history it's like a university history course every you know the 100 Uh level 200 level three 400 all in one and like the and and the way he does it he adds personality to it so it's 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 not like reading the slog of the textbook right it's you are completely in the whole time but where i was going with that is he did one on uh on uh, kind of the Gallic Wars at the end of Rome and kind of the the proceeding to the end of Rome. And you see how similar it is to what we're facing today. It's like, wow, the fall of Rome is like... We're kind of living in a time, I think, in a time in history where there's a big transition. You know, mm-hmm. there's always world, like, events yeah. that people will write about or yeah. will kind of star. They'll put an asterisk mm-hmm. where this was a big one, this yeah. is a big one, you know, like fall of Rome... You know, the Industrial Revolution, yeah. World War One, Two. Yeah. I feel like this one's another one where there's a huge transition going on of, you know, we think of like the digital world and like the analog, yeah. you know, where it's Big like time. physical and digital. Yeah. And everyone was and kind of pointing right- to, uh, everyone was kind of pointing to 9-11 as being that switch. And it's like, oh, I think we were kind of think we got a little bit too early on that one. Yeah. I think with the rate of change now it's like oh it's crazy we hadn't seen nothing like yeah. the, the the rate of change in 2001 that we thought was crazy and then like the passports proceeding- you know you brought in the passport to be able to travel and right. the, all that and now it's like it's crazy yeah. now they want all your medical records you need to show it before you go like they want everything digital mm-hmm. they have 
your SIN number to see if you pay your taxes, how much money you have, mm -hmm. what kind of mortgage what you, you have. What you spend it on. You, yeah. What, I saw MasterCard came out and they're... Who, I think this is true. I don't know. Another thing you find on the internet. Yeah, take it yeah. with a grain of salt. But they're coming out with a card that is going to track your digital footprint. So you pay for gas, hundred, you know, my truck, 135 liters, yeah. you know. Oh, I might be over for a week if I have to fill up two or three times. Well, now I can't buy anything. Wow. Your your credit kind of gets just and there it's like a trial with this That's with this scary. carbon footprint. So much Imagine of this ESG that. shit. This Imagine that, you know? Like, okay, uh, you go to an Oilers game. Well, they take into account that that's a big facility that uses a lot of yeah. energy. Well, you went to it. You attended it. So yeah. you partook in that mm -hmm. carbon footprint. Yeah. You're already your credits for the oh, week. There, yeah, yeah, there you yeah, go. You, you had to drive home. there. You bought, you know, a couple beers. Mm -hmm. You bought a burger. Well, yeah. that's meat. Yeah. Right? Oh, oh, you can't have that. Yeah, right? Yeah. Like, it's just, it's just crazy yeah. how deep this is going. Mm -hmm. And this is all just speculation right now, but it's slow. Mm -hmm. They're doing it very slow. Mm -hmm. They're, they're not dumb. Yeah. They know, they know how people work. They yeah. know how it's, it's going to be. people will buck back. And that's, and that's the, the program. Push just far enough to when you start to get pushed back and then kind of dial and it back. Dial, but yeah. that's what they're, that's what they've been doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. now, best summer ever. Open for summer. Yeah. Boom. Lockdown in the fall. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we're open again. Fuck. Another one's coming, man. Yeah. If we were to, I would be very surprised if we didn't have another one. And if it's not a COVID one, oh man, we had a really hot summer. That must mean that the fucking climate's going out of whack. We got a lockdown. Yeah. They'll find some reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of sketchy. Um, I want to talk a bit about like hunting and growing up in like doing that. Cause that's just so fascinating to me. I always loved hunting. I never really got into it in my grade 12 year. I couldn't play hockey. I was an overage. So I didn't get to play hockey. So me and Clinton and so was Clinton. So uh, we just, kind of hunted that whole fall and we just had a, a blast but we didn't know what the fuck we were doing we're a couple idiots in a truck with guns <laughs> more so than hunters if, you're, if we're completely honest with you but you grew up doing that shit from the time you could probably walk hey yeah like fuck i remember i see pictures of us as kids just holding grouse you know yeah, and yeah. my brother's in his diaper mm -hmm. and it was cool like my dad we'd have clients up and they'd bring their animals back and we'd be just kids and we'd always take pictures with them yeah. you know holding the deer and the you know moose and it was something we grew up doing and I got away from it with hockey because yeah. hockey was always so time consuming yeah. and I didn't get into it. And then my brother guided for my dad bears and I never did. And I was, I was always scared, you know, when, when your dad starts a company and he's good at it, yeah, you don't want to, you feel like you have to meet that or be yeah. there, you know, it's, tell me about it. <laughs> oh, you, you yeah. would know. And, yeah. and, you know, you feel that little added pressure. And mm -hmm. I, I was always worried like, oh, maybe I don't know what I'm doing because I didn't learn it. But yeah. I started doing it and I love it, you know? Yeah. Like, it's just, I just, I, well, I like being outside, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I live in Edmonton and in, I love going up to visit my parents. I love yeah. getting out of the city and yeah. just like getting out into the bush. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a nice feeling. Your yeah. phone, you don't have service. Yeah. You don't have to fucking see all the bullshit. Mm -hmm. This nice. a bit. Yeah. And... I don't know. It's just like it's something we've always done since mm -hmm. the beginning of time, mm -hmm. you know, like we've always needed to do it for sustenance to yeah. live. We have canine teeth and our eyes are on the front. They're out the front, you know, yeah. we're predators. Like yeah. we need, we hunt. So it was just like, I don't know. It's something that I got into when I started guiding and I just love it. You know, like yeah. I, I shot my first moose a couple of years ago with my dad, he, he guided me, yeah, you know, yeah. he called it in. He was grunting all the way. It was yeah. awesome. And that's like a memory that I'll have forever, for sure. you know, like yeah. forever. It was one of the coolest things I've ever, I've ever done. Mm -hmm. And then last year I got my first deer and that was cool. You know, yeah. like if I'm going to be guiding and these guys are going to be, Oh, well, you, what's the biggest deer? Like I probably should have got one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That <laughs> helps. That if helps. I'm telling them, you know, yeah. all this stuff, but yeah. It's just like a nice release, you know, mm -hmm. you get away from the concrete jungle and you're out there and, you know, it sounds kind of cliche, but it's actually like, it's just like fulfilling too. For know? sure. And and I'd imagine like 
speaking to anybody that's ever, you know, hunted themselves will know that, that rush and just like what accomplishment, the memory that you're going to have forever, right? Like I've, other than chickens, I, I shot one deer and that was that, that, that fall with me and Clinton. And it was like, still, I remember that day. Like, I don't remember a lot of days that crystal clear of like everything that happened, yeah. like start to finish. It was wild. And then I would imagine as a guide to be able to know how crazy that feeling is for yourself and then to provide that to people. Like that sounds like a crazy way to make a living. Like just the, n- not, not the money or the, or the being outdoors, but just the, uh, the, the, like the, re- the, the rewardingness of it would probably be different than a lot of other things people can do. For sure. It is, you know, y- you take a lot of, uh, different clients. Some have different expectations. Some, yeah, have hunted everywhere in the world, like every corner of the world. And when I see a guy who saved up for years and years and years to come and say he's lucky enough to get something, Mm -hmm. the sheer joy that he has, it makes me feel good. For sure. And I'm so excited for him and I'm just so happy. But there's also the other side of it where you do have clients that they it, hunting's tough. Yeah. It's you think sometimes you think it's bigger than you thought, or it's different. You, you just kind of, you had a trigger finger and yeah. you just, and some seem disappointed and I don't like that because you don't pay homage. You're just, right. you're not paying respect to the actual animal. And mm-hmm. yeah, some people might think, Oh yeah, you know, he's pre- pretending like he cares. Oh no, it's, that's our livelihood. Yeah. Like, you don't just want guys coming up and just shooting shit just to shoot it. You yeah. know, you want them to be proud of what they got. Mm-hmm. Put the effort in and, 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 and see the and, results. Yeah, and exactly. Like we put the effort in to get them what they want yeah. and we want them to be happy. So it's so nice seeing like this last fall, I was up helping my old man and there was this uh, guy from New York and he got a deer and I saw him standing by the road and he was so happy he was like yeah. thanking god and it was yeah. meant to be and I, he's like you know it's not the big it was a great deer yeah like six by six yeah. like great deer like i'm like man like you should be he was ecstatic yeah he's like it's not the biggest i'm like man if it was the, always the biggest yeah well, like there would it would be it wouldn't be fun mm-hmm. you know that's the whole thrill of it yeah and it was a nice great deer yeah not small I told him, I'm like, man, this isn't a small deer. Yeah. It's not a world record, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he was so happy and that just made me feel good Mm -hmm. that he enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh man, this was the best trip, you know, and that's what that makes, you're kind of in the service industry, you know, like you want people to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Tell their friends, It's not a guarantee. When you hunt, it's not a guarantee because there's so many uncontrollables, weather, whether they want to move or not. It's, you know, right place, right time. Mm -hmm. And- Mm -hmm. It's just rewarding when you have a client that is happy with what you what provide. they what they what what we what we provide and whether it's if they get one or not, you mm-hmm. know. We have clients that they come up and they it's it's different. Some guys come up and they know what they want. Yeah. Okay, I want a one eighty class Alberta whitetail and above. Okay. Yeah. We will try for that because they are there. Yeah. You know, Northern Alberta is world class whitetails. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're there, but you got to be patient and you, as long as you know what you're looking for yeah. and that the, the, the chances aren't, you know, you, you'll see deer, but, or moose or bears, but yeah, you just, it's just nice. It's, I don't know. It's a rewarding feeling. Yeah, I bet and it would be. It, I just like being out and. Yeah. And you probably fun. see some really cool people too that oh, are man. coming up. Like. Interesting stories at the campfire. Blake Shelton is supposed to come bear hunting this really? year. Really? But holy fuck, that'd be cool. It's hard with those guys yeah. too because yeah. they their schedule changes mm-hmm. daily. On like, whim, yeah. You know, so he was supposed to come. I remember uh, my mom got a call from a guy, Jim Tomey. Jim Tomey. So he's a baseball player. He's got yeah. over five hundred home runs, Hall oh, of cool. Famer. And he's like, "Yeah, I want to come whitetail hunting." And my mom's like, "Oh." He kind of explained who he was. Yeah. And my mom's like. Unless you play hockey, I don't know who the fuck you are. Yeah, yeah. I can I can <laughs> just guy, hear your mom saying that. The guy's that, like, yeah. uh, okay, yeah. um, I'd like to come deer hunting. And she's yeah. like, oh, we're booked for two years, bud. Like, yeah. grab a spot <laughs> yeah, a few yeah. years down the line. I'm like, mom, this guy's a Hall of Fame yeah, baseball yeah. player. Get his ass up here. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And like, uh, 
Jay Lynx, you know, Jack Lynx beef jerky. Like yeah. you need some cool people. I like, bet. like that just, I took the CEO of Kohler, um, Whoa. you know, like Kohler taps, yeah. toilets, yeah. like they literally have a town in Wisconsin named after Kohler. Yeah. They own Whistling Straits golf course where the PGA champion. Holy shit. So I was at, I was sitting in a truck with them, you know, bear hunting and yeah. driving to and from, and I just bullshit with him like mm -hmm. hey man like uh pga championship was at in wisconsin last year he's like yeah we own the course so i was like oh, holy shit cool he's yeah like, yeah if you're ever in wisconsin give us a call you know you can stay at the they called it the estate i think it's like holy an old shit. english townhouse yeah. like huge and i was like okay well I'm, i probably won't make her to wisconsin yeah anytime, but if but i do yeah, yeah. I'm sure but he was a super nice guy yeah. like he just wanted to get away from his stressful job For of sure. running a billion dollar company mm -hmm. you know and they flew into slave with their, I don't know, G G six or yeah. you know their yeah. jet, and yeah. they all got out. And I'm like, fuck. Usually, you know, like those, some of those guys are a little more difficult. But he was such a nice guy. Yeah. He brought his sons, and they had a great time. You know, we got some bears, and you meet a lot of a lot of cool people. Yeah, I bet. And it's not always the mega rich. Like, mm -hmm. there's so many people that just all different walks of life yeah. that come up and you hear their, their, their stories yeah. and shit, like where they've hunted or what they've done in their life. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty cool. Yeah. And it just like, uh, for yourself too, you get to, you know, take in all those life experiences, all these interesting people, right. And, and get all these stories and all that. You, you probably grow a lot as it's a, a network in that. itself too, yeah, right? 100% like, it is. You know, um, so my brother, he was an HVAC, didn't like it. So he went into culinary culinary school yeah. and he's a chef now. Yeah. And he's like, I might be biased because he's my brother, but yeah. he's unreal. The shit he puts on, I've been bugging he's him to get him on the podcast. Unreal, he, man. He's just down in Panama just, fishing. Yeah, right? he was in Panama fishing. It's, it's it comes natural. Like, yeah. he's, just a, he's just a natural, like he knows what goes with what mm -hmm. and how to make it good. And he's met some hunters that own like restaurants in the States. They're yeah. like, man, like, we got you. Like if yeah. you ever want to, you know, move around. And so this one client he had, these Korean guys from California, I think mm -hmm. they owned a nightclub in oh, Newport beach or Huntington beach or yeah. something. And pretty, you know, ritzy night mm -hmm. or a club, not yeah. a nightclub, but club, you know, day club, beach mm -hmm. club. Brady was there, Tom Brady and Giselle. <laughs> yeah. They had their kids. Well, some of the other people there didn't want the kid, like for kids to be mm -hmm. in a club. So they had to ask Brady and Giselle to <laughs> to beat it. Can you imagine being that guy? Imagine that gets going that? up to Tom Brady and be like, "Hey, Mr. Brady, uh, some of the members don't want kids in here, so yeah. gonna have to you ask gotta you to go, leave, bud." Yeah. Oh, Can you God. imagine the stones? Like, yeah, that's oh. just Tom fucking Brady no here. Shit. You gotta kick yeah. rocks, buddy. Yeah, if, I, if someone <laughs> asked me to go tell Tom Brady to leave, like, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have to find someone else for that one there, bub. Holy shit. Yeah. Holy fuck, that's wild. Yeah, you, you meet some really cool people. and I bet. And they're all like, well, not all, but I would say they're just like, they're just regular people. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, sure, they they have, they could do whatever they want in the world, but yeah. they wanted, this Norwegian guy, billionaire, his billions, they, yeah. him and like, they build uh, freight, sh freighter ships, you know, like they, mm -hmm. they carry sea cans, yeah. like those huge yeah. ones. Those big Maersk ships or whatever. Like yeah. Yeah. And all he wanted to do was go to the trap line and just trap. Yeah. And my dad's like, you have all the money in the fucking world. You Why do you want to go up into the fucking middle of nowhere and minus 30 and trap? He goes, cause I can't do it anywhere else. Yeah. That's all he wanted to do. Yeah. I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. You know, like. How long has your dad been doing it? Oh, I think he. Oh, I think he started when he was eighteen, and it's his birthday today, and he's fifty-four, so thirty-six, thirty-five, thirty-six years. Wow! And that's how you get that type of clientele doing it for thirty-six yeah, like, years, and probably just started with doing it with local, like helping well, local he, guys. Around. He was a he was a pipe fitter with my great uncle, like his uncle, yeah, in slave, and he liked it and stuff. But he just, I don't know, he just was loved hunting yeah he's good at it and he's just like oh fuck it you know i'll yeah. start my own company and see what happens mm -hmm. and he had a guide area in bc so doing rat like sheep and mm -hmm. goats and moose and i hear that's some crazy hunting that sheep yeah like it's that's a young man's yeah. sport man yeah. like those mountains and stuff like 
And then he sold it. My my mom was scared of grizzly bears, and we were I, I was just like a little little yeah. kid, and my sister was just born, and mm-hmm. there's grizzlies everywhere. Yeah. So she's like, "Fuck this! I ain't coming yeah. up here." Yeah. My dad's like, "Okay," so he sold it, and he just done it in Alberta, and yeah, he just loved to hunt. Yeah. But when you make it a job, you he doesn't get to hunt anymore. Right. So it's you lose that, mm-hmm. but at least you still get to bring that to other people. Mm-hmm. You, you know? trade it. And yeah, he, he's always loved it and mm-hmm. pretty cool, you know, been fortunate. Yeah. That's awesome. Like that. I remember, uh, when I was, uh, I don't know, I think it was maybe grade five. We had to do a project where we had to like, do like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I always saw Troy and I thought that was the coolest fucking thing. So I, I did my whole thing on being an outfitter and, all that stuff. and then like looking yeah. back now, I was like, fuck, you never like hunted nothing in your life at that point. <laughs> what are you even talking about? But yeah. I just thought that was the coolest shit. That's, you know? it is cool. That's, that's what I want to do. And yeah. it's tough. It's hard work, you know, like For there's sure. so many uncontrollables, mm-hmm. like fuck mm-hmm. man. You're bear hunting and you get rain for two weeks straight. Yeah. Well, you know the country up there. Fuck. Get, your, get your quad, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you better know how to quad because yeah. you ain't driving a truck. No. Do you ever get some guys that never been on a quad before and you try and tra- take them up? Do you ever? <laughs> I bet you do. I bet Man. you do. When we go moose hunting, it's if you get a wet season, it takes about seven hours on a quad to go about 40 clicks. Yeah. Right into the middle, like through the fucking nastiest mm-hmm. muskeg you can mm-hmm. get, you know, and... You get guys that I would say are a little bit out of shape and oh. you got them on the back of a quad yeah. and it makes it a little bit, it's tough, yeah. you know, and it's a little bit of an eye opener. They yeah. see where we go and mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's tough. Like yeah. it's a tough country. Yeah. It's not, it's not just driving around open fields and. Yeah. Yeah. Sit in your pickup till you see something walk by. And, and we, get, we get that a lot too where. A lot of guys will go to Africa and they have those ranch hunts, mm-hmm. you know, fenced. Yeah. Or in the States where you see a deer and you go, what about that one? And the guy goes, no, that one's already bought. So people yeah. buy deer. Those high fence operations. And they yeah. just expect them to come up and free range, you know, thick bush. Yeah. It's not like that. Yeah, it's a different but type But that's of hunt. not, it's not called, sh- it's not called shooting. It's called hunting. Yeah. It was called, if he was guaranteed, it that would take the fun out of it. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you, you might get one, you might not. Mm-hmm. That's the whole mm-hmm. thrill of the hunt. Yeah. That's where it comes from. So yeah. you kind of have to balance that and make it known. Otherwise mm-hmm. there's, uh, you know, lofty expectations that right. come with it. But so do you guys like try and how do you guys try and set those expectations to make sure? Cause I'm sure you get some guys that are, you know, I've been hunting their whole life and they, they know the deal and they're coming in, but you probably get guys that are coming in. Maybe this is their first time hunting, like thinking, Oh, it's going to be guaranteed. I get what I want. Well, we say it right out. It's not guaranteed. But, yeah. You, know, you, you lay that out. It's not guaranteed. Mm-hmm. You know, like we will do whatever we can mm-hmm. to have to put you in the opportunity yeah. to get one. And then it's up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Put the ball in your court. It's up to you. Then you have, if you have, some guys don't get it. And then you're like, okay, you know, like that shit happens, mm-hmm. but you want to work as hard as you can to put them yeah. in that opportunity. Yeah. And you, sometimes you just, some guys want it easy, mm-hmm. which is like anything, you yeah. know, some guys want to try guys. and, you know, some guys want to play in the NHL and they think it's going to be easier. Some guys want to start a business and they think it's going to be easy. Yeah. Any walk of life, not, it's not going to be mm-hmm. easy. Nothing is easy. Nothing's just given to you. So. You kind of have to make that known and, but that's part of it. It's mm-hmm. a service industry yeah. still. So yeah, you, regardless of what expectations you got to try and make, make do with what, what they're coming in with and yeah. try and make it enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite thing to guide? Um, moose hunting is my favorite. Yeah. I love the fall. Yeah. When you're calling them and they come crashing in. Like, yeah. It's like a rush. Yeah. It's a rush, man. Heart like gets it's, pounding. Yeah. The, and well, Unless you're standing over like a moose, you don't realize how fucking big they are, man. Mm-hmm. They're prehistoric shit. Mm-hmm. Like, the, like their horns and they're just how big they are. Yeah. Like, it's just yeah. awesome. And then I love the fall. Like, the fall yeah. is fall in Alberta, northern it's Alberta. Is the smell, else. yeah. Like, it's yeah. just something different, man. It's like mm-hmm. it's just nice. And for moose, you're pretty like you got to go. It's remote. Mm-hmm. Like you're out there. Mm-hmm. Um, moose hunting's fun. Deer hunting is more stressful. Uh, 
you know, the clientele we take deer is that's their apex. Like they yeah. love big white tails yeah. or big mule deer. They just mm-hmm. love it. Mm-hmm. And it's a little tougher. Um, and there's a lot more, I don't know, pressure maybe. Yeah. And then bear hunting is bear hunting, you know, yeah. it's, it's fun, Yeah. but there's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know, that, there's yeah. a lot of bears, you know, but it's fun, you know, like. You, you grind the whole winter of just like cold and then you get to the spring and you're mm-hmm. finally like, fuck, it's finally getting nice, you know, yeah. getting out there, bears, you know, yeah. like it's leaves are changing. It's getting mm-hmm. green again. So it's a good time of the year. Do you ever notice, this might be a weird question, but do you ever notice like a certain type of clientele for like different animals? Like, like, do you, I'm sure it's, you get all kinds for all kinds, but like on average, is there like a certain type of guy that's going to come up and hunt bear versus deer versus moose or anything? Or maybe you haven't been doing it. No, long enough honestly, uh, a lot of clients would like kind of, They'll do it all. Yeah. You know, they'll do it all. It depends on where they come from. You know, mm. some places they have their own bear hunting or, right. you know, but right. like world-class free range whitetails. Yeah. Canada's the apex. Yeah. There's nowhere better. And then moose is, you have your Alaska Yukon moose, which is the biggest. Yeah. They're the biggest by horn size mm-hmm. and physical mass. They're just, a, it's a different subspecies. So, yeah. but you're paying 20, 30, 35,000 a Ooh. hunt. Whoa. And that's up there. And then, so we have the Canada moose, which is a little bit smaller. We get some, still we get some fucking giants, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Like there's some big ones, but so it's all, and then there's the Shiraz moose, which is a little bit smaller. Never heard of that. Yeah. Shiraz moose is a little bit smaller. It's more South. Okay. In, some into the States. And then in, I think it might even be out to Quebec and stuff. They're mm-hmm. just a little bit smaller mm-hmm. horns and stuff, but. Shiraz it's, moose. Yeah. It's, that's a new there's, one. yeah. And, they, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's all different strokes for different folks, right? Sure. You know, like yeah. you get the, the guys who want that mm-hmm. Alaska, like my dream, my bucket list dream hunt is the Alaska Yukon moose. Yeah. Like that is, I'll save up and I want to go on one one day. Yeah. Or maybe you'll guide somebody. I wonder if there's ever like a kind of like trade off where you, you take a guy and guide and then you can go we, do We used to do that where we go salmon fishing every year. Oh right, yeah, yeah. And yeah. on the west coast and then come you know, it's like a you trade and there is that, but Do you guys take guys out fishing too? Is that no, part of it? No. No. Slave's tough, you know, like it's Anybody can go throw a throw a rod in Slave Lake and you're gonna yeah, catch like, something. You don't really need much guy. I was working with a guy last last summer and he's like, Yeah, I go fishing in slave, you know. Sometimes it's tough, we don't catch anything and I'm like what <laughs> on fucking slave man yeah. put my toe in the water yeah. and i'll fucking catch one but yeah i'm not i'm not a big fisherman but like man i remember even sometimes going out as a kid and catch like a hundred fish in like oh, an hour yeah. it was like this is absurd i keep them up i i love fishing fishing's awesome we yeah. go everywhere west coast you know salmon halibut mm-hmm. fishing on the ocean then we go to the northwest territories northwest lake territories. trout like big jacks like yeah. big like 30 pounders Holy fuck. That's a i remember big fish. i remember tom tom caught one and we were younger. I don't know. Maybe he was 12 or 10 or 12. And my dad was fucking around and knocked it off with the net. <laughs> Tom was so fucking Fired. bad at him. Oh, man. <laughs> just like, just the worst. Yeah. Like the worst thing you could ever do. And yeah. What are you going to do? You're not going to yeah. take a 30 pound jack home. But yeah. it was just, it's up there. It's so fun, man. It's so nice. That's a nice area up there, hey? It is. Yeah. You know, like, uh, we went up there, I think it was up there three or four times, and it's a big, big fucking scary lake, though. Like, yeah. There was a couple times where it was rough, and it was like, fuck, man. Yeah. Kind of got the edge of you. are on the edge of your seat. Like, yeah. Adds a little bit of flavor to fishing, yeah, hey? Yeah, like when there's a Coast Guard for a lake, you know, it's a fucking big boy. Oh, shit. Know, Coast Guard big, for a lake? Yeah, you put your big boy pants on. But yeah, yeah. It's, it was fun, man. Fucking lake trout up there, you... At times, like certain areas, you would try to cast and reel as fast as you can to not catch one. That's how many there are. You can Holy see them shit. in the water. They fucking, you catch one and another one will come and fucking T-bone it to try. And, it's crazy. <laughs> Holy what? Yeah. That's nuts. World, it's world-class fishing yeah. up there. Yeah. I think my dad might've went up there one time on a, yeah. on a fishing trip when, yeah. he, when I was younger. Any other, uh, I know you said Yukon moose, but is there any other bucket list hunts that you got or? Uh, Kodiak brown bear. Yeah. Yeah. My dad went on one, uh. Probably six years ago, I think. Is that that fucking? He does he have it at your house? Yeah, I saw that thing. That was like standing. Yeah, it's like it's like ten foot or nine foot (laughs) six or something. Yeah, and his was the smallest shot that week. 
What? It's like there was a couple 11 footers. Holy Christ. And he's like, uh, pictures don't do it justice. Like yeah. if you see in the house and you stand beside it, you're like, yeah. man, this thing's a fucking, it's a, it's a car. Yeah. I couldn't believe because we were, oh, you guys were having a, a party a couple summers back and uh, I was bullshitting with Clinton and your mom and, and you were telling me about the brand. I said, oh, come up and see it. So we went upstairs yeah. and I'm like, holy fuck. Like just yeah. to stand underneath the thing is like absurd. That's a bucket list yeah. one. It's That'd just, be unreal. well, like Kodiak is, it's an island off Alaska. Yeah. So genetically, it's locked there. Mm -hmm. Like the genetics mm -hmm. don't go anywhere else. It's just locked on the island yeah. and it's the biggest brown bears in the world. Mm -hmm. Maybe in Russia, they are rival. Mm -hmm. But they're fucking huge, man. They're oh. like they're literally cars on yeah. legs. Yeah. And they're fast and they fuck and they're mean. Yeah. And that's a bucket list one for sure. Is that another one that costs a bit of an arm and a leg to get out there? Yeah. Got to know the right guy, maybe, or something. Well, it's just like you just book a couple of years out, you right. know, like they're booked. Right. And for there, they, they have really good conservation there. So if you shoot one, you can't shoot one for two years, I think. Mm -hmm. So they kind of make it so that you can't just fucking ravage yeah, it. Yeah, and yeah, they yeah. only issue certain, like the outfitters are the only ones that have the tags. And then residents can go every two years, I think, if yeah. they get one. So they do a really good job of <laughs> conserving their, you know, their wildlife. Their population, yeah. Yeah, and it's tough. It's rugged, you know. Yeah. Like you can have fucking snow, mm -hmm. rain, wind, yeah. sunny day, all in fucking five hours. Yeah. Like you're hiking mountains, they're apex predators too. So they fucking, they're not dumb, yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. they're smart. Yeah. And yeah. That's and they're it. all over the place too. So you're hunting them and they're hunting you at the same well, time. Yeah, and, <laughs> and the fucking willows, the alders are so thick. Like can't it, see them coming. Like my dad was saying there's where the area he went in, there's bear trails that are like this fucking deep, like two Holy feet shit. deep into the fucking ground. Whoa. For hundreds of years, they've just walked the same trails yeah. and it's, Fuck, that'd be a cool place just to see the place. Like, yeah. No, let alone the hunt. He said, but. you see king crab just in the fucking bays there. Like, wow. It, it's just, and there's foxes that just walk up to you because there's not a lot of people. Yeah. So they're like, yeah. oh, we don't know what these people are. We don't know that they're psychopaths. They're yeah, yeah, fucking skin us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let us walk up to them. And yeah, he said it was, said it was a once in a lifetime trip. Yeah. That's awesome. Fuck. Did you ever, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head who it was, but there was that, uh, He's one of the more, more popular hunters. He's got a podcast and stuff, and a big group of them went out. I'm not sure if it was Kodiak or if it was a Fognac Island, and they uh, were they had a kill. I think they were gutting it or moving it out, and they were having a little camp, having dinner, and a bear came down into their camp on them and, and bull rushed him, and one guy ended up on top of it and rode it down the hill. Have you ever heard that, uh, that story? I haven't, no, but... Oh, man, it's pretty wild. My dad had a guide... For years, yeah, shit. We had we called him Uncle. Like he yeah. was, you worked for him for years, and he we used to guide up in northern BC. And he had a hunter, and they were sitting around the fire, and fucking grizzly came out and fucking attacked his hunter. Holy shit! And luckily, the hunter had his gun set on like on a log that yeah. they were sitting on, and the guy grabbed the gun and fucking shot it. And the guy it fucking clawed his face up yeah. and like pretty fucked him up pretty good. Like he didn't die, but yeah. Felt it. Yeah, that's oh, for yeah. sure. Holy like it shit. Was hairy. Yeah. Those things can do so much. Like in two I seconds, remember, they can I do. I remember grayling fishing on the Sarge Creek, like south of town. Yeah. And we were just fishing and my dad's, like we were kids and he saw grizzly tracks in the sand and we didn't know how fresh. Yeah. So we kept walking up the creek and fishing and then the the tracks were wet on the rocks. It was like plus 30 outside. Yeah. So you know how fast yeah. it's and we're like, oh, fuck. Yeah. There was cubs. And we got to get yeah. the other way, you know, like. Get the fuck out of there. Or anything, yeah. But they're around town. Like, there's. Mm -hmm. there's I've never seen one. <laughs> there's a lot more now than there used to be. Yeah, because I was, growing up, I always heard, oh, there's no, there's no grizzly. Well, the around. Alberta record was shot in Slave. Really? Right, just south of Slave. By a, by a twin. Oh. Years ago, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maybe one of Cody's yeah. old, like older relatives. Yeah. yeah the Alberta yeah. record was shot by oh, slave. Shit. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. What's the, how big's the fucking record? Probably just skulls. It's skull size. So oh, they, that's they measured a, skull yeah. size. So I don't even know how many inches it is, but it's big. It's got to be a big, big one. Yeah. yeah. 
like a fucking drum. Yeah. <laughs> Holy it's shit. Fucking... Oh, it's crazy shit. Yeah. Oh, well, anything we missed? Anything we... I should probably let you get back home, not take your whole Saturday up. No, oh, it's all good, man. It was yeah. fun. Yeah, it's fun to talk about some of that Black Rock shit. I think that's the first time I've actually had a conversation with someone that knows what that is when yeah, I bring it up. Everyone always gives me that quizzical look. What is that? I'm like, ah, never mind. It's, it's kind of into the conspiracy shit, yeah. but I mean... Uh, the way I look at it is it, if it continually keeps showing up mm -hmm. from different mm -hmm. sources, maybe there's more truth to it than yeah. they're making it seem, you know? Yeah. Like if it if you keep seeing it and you're like, what mm -hmm. the fuck, you know? And it's not a conspiracy that the company exists. It's not an a conspiracy yeah. that they're investing in these companies. Like yeah. even if you don't follow down like the 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 – the logical follow-ups of, of, of the, just take all that aside and just look at what it is. It's just interesting to know that that operates in the world and like yeah. how much money is tied up in it and Trillions. the people involved. It's, yeah. yeah. Like they're talking about, you know, Jeff Bezos and all these guys like, no, that's, that, that's small potatoes oh. when you really know the real, the yeah. real thing. These guys are, mm -hmm. they're big, big fish, big fish. And I like, I hope the people that listen don't, you know, think we're all at crack pots. Yeah. Like, you do we do a lot of research in mm -hmm. this you know and mm -hmm. it's not just like spitting out random shit yeah. just maybe have an open mind like yeah. there is other stuff out there that mm -hmm. we, maybe you haven't heard of before yeah. and yeah you know like if someone brought something to light then i'm like oh, i didn't hear about that so it's yeah. got to be fucking fake like yeah. no like there is where there's smoke there's fire mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. you just open mind i think yeah. you just need yeah. to have an open mind to a lot of this shit exactly yeah, that's perfect. Well, thanks again for coming. I'm sure we'll do this again sometime. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. Yeah, it was fun. Get Tom on next. Do, yeah, some, uh, do some, cooking. some cooking. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, teach me some cooking or just fucking cook me some shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, either I'm, way, I'm either a way. I have one with him cooking some shit, yeah. That, uh, I've got some ideas. I'll tell you. Once, we, once we're off the podcast, I'll tell you all about it. All right. All right thanks, brother. Yeah, no problem. All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, if you want to follow me on social media, it's the Von Dubcast on almost everything except Twitter, which... I would like to get more followers on, but maybe I have to <laughs> write that down for the next intro so I can tell you the actual uh, um, handle of it. I think it's dub underscore Vaughn. It's one of those things with Twitter where you type it in, you think you have the name, and it just kind of converts it to something close, and then you're stuck with that, which is slightly annoying. Maybe at some point in the future, if I get some sort of tech wizard to help me out with this, <laughs> this podcast, I'll get that fixed. But for now, follow that. Other than that, please follow TJ on uh, social media. It should be linked in the description below. Also, uh, Reach out to him if you enjoyed the conversation. Reach out to him. That always really helps with uh, getting new guests on when you can show um, that there's um, positive attributes that come with coming on and having a conversation with me and, you know, donating a couple hours of time. And I value my time very highly and I really appreciate in others when they're willing to take that risk if they don't know what they're getting into when they, do, when they step onto this podcast. And I hope to make it enjoyable. And part of that is with you guys by letting them know if you enjoyed it or not. So if you guys could do that, that'd be awesome. Um, check out Oilers Uncensored episode one. It's really great content. I think you'll love it. Um, enter the ticket giveaway, share the post, like it, tag all those fun things that I'm terrible at with social media. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not great with social media, but I think I'm getting the hang of this whole podcast and thing. And I really enjoy it. And just want to say thank you guys for all, all you that listen and support and reach out I couldn't do it without you, and it's thanks to you that I get to live my dream doing this stuff. So I'm going to keep rocking at it. You guys keep supporting. And one more time, apologies if it's windy and you can hear that whistling in the background. Uh, I'm going to see if there's anything I can do about it. If not, I might just have to record on the less windy days, which living in northern Alberta sometimes is a little bit tough. But other than that, I think the, con the, uh, the content of the conversation is going to overpower any audio glitches. That's, that's the hope anyway. So hope you guys have a great week. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.